how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Antonio, and I'm uh, I'm trying out this um, new format right now, where hopefully each week I can um, bring in sort of a get a medals update show. I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, but maybe I can bring in a guest um, to go through some of the more topical issues in the commodity space, sort of a, a news type of thing. Uh, this week, I'm 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 splitting it into. I don't have a name for it yet again, so all suggestions are welcome. I um well obviously there's you no know, I answer every single comment on here, so I'll dip oh this line's not on. That should be better. But I'll um I'll definitely get to see your comments. Uh but it, it's gonna be something like old world where it's like gold, silver, copper, uh in, in one of the reports, and then new world where it's like uranium, lithium, nickel, rare earths. That's something I've been thinking about and all the other new world stuff, if you will. Again, feed feedback is evidenced by this intro, very much needed. So uh, help a ginger out here. But yeah, uh, a news overview first and then the normally scheduled CEO barbecues, what is happening right now. It's three companies in this one. So we're going from Africa to Japan. We're going to Mexico, a bunch of places. And um, even somewhat of a unique royalty company is going to be in here. So uh, a lot to talk about. But uh, Sam, I'll kick it off with you. Sam Broom here from Sprout Asset Management, by the way. So I'll kick it off with you. Thank you, first of all, for being here. And it was a tweet that you quote uh quote tweeted quote ext whatever it's called it was a tweet by jared dillian late last week where he was talking about how the fed uh, might be using interest rates to rig the election with a bunch of other uh, i suppose assumptions in there stuff that could be happening happening and, and and essentially concluding that commodity prices and inflation could ramp up before the elections late this year if they actually were doing that and um, but so why I'm why I'm even bringing this up is because I I sort of I, I saw your tweet I saw the price action in gold the sort of wild move it was up and then down it was quite volatile, um, and I thought like hey is is there something maybe happening below the surface something that I'm I'm not seeing I'm not thinking about, and then he sort of alluded to something along those lines so I just basically wanted to talk to you about that but yeah what's uh, what's happening there, yeah um, thanks for having me on by the way um, it's it's an interesting time in the space I mean it's been tough it's been a tough space for a long period of time. And then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to notice that something's sort of flicked just in the last five, six weeks um, in the space. Um, you know, a lot of people watch what's going on in central bank land for insights into what's happening in the price of gold and everything related to that. Um, we've, we've been in a very weird world the last year or two in the gold space where you've had the Fed, you know, at face value tightening um, by raising interest rates, but you've also had the treasury on the other side, basically with its foot on the accelerator with these massive fiscal deficits we've been seeing. So they've, they've almost counteracted each other. Um, you know, in that post by Jared, and, and I've seen a number of people talking about it online now, we've, we've sort of reached a point with the deficit where, um, Increasing interest rates, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the chart of gold completely decoupling from things like long-term bond yields, right? Um, and even the real rate um, where typically gold is almost moves in lockstep with real rates, right? Real rates go higher. That's terrible for gold and vice versa. But just the last, you know, the last six months, that's completely diverged. Um, and there's a lot of people speculating why that's happening. Um, you know, who really knows? But the most plausible exploration I've seen is that, you know, people will just start doing the math and and realize that in a world as, as a wash in debt, and especially at the sovereign level, and especially places like here in the US now, you know, those higher interest rates and particularly higher real interest rates start to become, you know, like the, the problem of how does the how does the US government service its debt at these interest rate levels? You know, it becomes from a sort of problem way down the road to something they're going to have to start tackling meaningfully now. Um, so my view is that it's the potentially the gold market sniffing out um, this current level of high real yields, right? If you believe CPI is accurate and you know at three, three and change, um, and you see you know short term rates at five, five, five and a five point three percent, you know you got a two hundred basis point real yield there like that. In a world as awash with debt as we have right now, that's just not sustainable for long. You know, things start to break, things start to become really problematic. Um, so my view is that, you know, this partially, partially the reason for this gold price move is the broader investment community starting to sniff this out, that, you know, we're probably not 
going to see this high of a real yield for long, despite inflation starting to pick up again. You know, the question becomes, you know, would the Fed turn around and, you know, we're all arguing how many, how many rate cuts we're going to price in at the moment. You know, would they realistically, could they raise rates with higher inflation? Um, and I think a lot of people think they can't. You know, I mean, we had Biden out five days ago when asked about the Fed and tackling inflation, you know, still sticking with his guns, <laughs> mm. um, suggesting they're going to cut rates this year, you know, and saying it might be a month or two delayed, but basically saying we're going to cut rates um, just as inflation's picking back up. Um, gold tends to be a pretty good asset at sniffing things out 12, 18 months ahead of time. Um, you know, the last big run up in the gold price prior to the move we're currently seeing came sort of 2019, 2020, you know, about 12, 18 months before the big inflation spike. Um, you know, perhaps it's as simple as the market sniffing out, you know, a return to neutral or even negative real yields again, which is typically, you know, massively bullish for things like gold. Hmm. I don't know if you've seen what, what Lynn Alden has been talking about, especially on Twitter and stuff like that. But she, so she talks about fiscal dominance and 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 that kind of explains what's, what's happening to gold, I think, well. I need to get her on again soon, by the way, to talk about that. But uh, I like that explanation here as well. And also just, you know, rising liquidity, more fiscal spending, uh, maybe typical for an election year and the year after the election year based on the promises that typically get made during that election year. Um, I mean, does that, does that, does that make sense to you? Like, could that also be a tailwind for gold? Yeah. I mean, I think there's no question we're entering a phase. I think we've already entered the beginnings of a phase of fiscal dominance. You know, I mean, you just look at the sheer deficit at the moment at max unemployment, you know, it's, it's, if you look at the data, it's like Goldilocks, you know, and yet we're, deficits are running you know the biggest they've ever been as a percentage of gdp outside of world war ii and in the covid year so you know i i love lynn's work i think she does great work um you know i buy into all of all of her takes um on what's going on um, I, I think it's it's you know i mean nothing's certain in the world i've been in this game long enough to know that you know nothing is certain but i would argue that the probability that that development, you know, an increasingly fiscally dominant economy is wildly bullish for things like gold and other hard assets. Um, it's, it's, you know, this, the math is the math, right? <laughs> um, it's just, it, it's how it's going to be, I think. Um, th there are other facets um, to the gold, the current gold price move. Um, you know, I, I don't, I actually don't think right now, based on what we're seeing, the move in the gold price has much to do with what's going on in the West at all. Um, it, it, it does look like, um, you know, I mean, if you look at what's going on in the big Western gold backed vehicles, like, you know, the big gold ETFs, I mean, they're, they're still hemorrhaging gold, right? There's, there's net outflows this year. There has been net outflows for years out of those things. We've seen no massive inflows into traditional western um ways to buy and and trade gold um you know we're not seeing any fingerprints of it on the usual you know futures market or the options market and things like that where western institutions typically play um you know we're not seeing huge uptick in gold stored at the bank of england or the new york fed or anything like that like it's not it, it's you know there's, there's obviously all these conspiracy theories out there um that it's physical buying out of asia probably China, um, you know, and, and I don't know, I don't, you know, no one knows for sure at this point, but that to, to me, the last six months, sorry, the last six weeks of buying out of the gold prices had more to do with buying out of one or multiple central banks in the, in the East somewhere, whether it's China, whether it's Iran ahead of the shenanigans that went on over the weekend. Um, it, it appears to be physical buying and it appears to be not, western related at least at this point um mm. in terms of the bulk of it so you know um yeah that, that's what we're seeing at the moment uh, and that's exactly what i was thinking about it like is because because you say it doesn't seem to be western centric if you will because i'm just thinking is that really the biggest driver is 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 fear maybe part of the part of the drive behind it um, or is it so that for example i mean what's happening in the middle east right now with iran right since uh, this week in well, that's going to have an impact from a fear perspective, but also I'm thinking, is this going to have an impact from, I mean, fiscal spending, like more wars? Does the West 
mingle into all of that eventually? And is, is gold sort of sniffing that out? Is it a combination of both? And there's sort of a lot of things up in the air right now, if, if, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably, it's always a, it's usually a combination of all of the above. And it's just a, a matter of what is the main driver at the moment. You know, I mean, back when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2020, the US kind of showed the world the playbook. If, if you do something that we really don't like, um, this is what we're going to do. Um, you know, if I, if I was a foreign central bank that even had a slight worry that I was going to get on the wrong side of the US, you know, I'd be diversifying out of my US dollar denominated and controlled foreign exchange reserves. And I'd be looking for new, <laughs> counterparty free risk neutral assets, right? Like gold, um, you know? Um, so I think that angle makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I think, you know, you look at, I mean, China's, current holdings, official holdings of US dollar denominated FX reserves are back at 20, 2001 levels, right? Which is when they got got added to the WTO. So they've completely dumped all of their, you know, well, not all, but a significant quantity of their US dollar exposure, basically. Um, you know, and it, it is looking like they're loading up with, with gold here. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone listening to this has probably heard about how the you know, the, the Shanghai physical exchange now is starting to, I don't know if it's dominating the price of gold, but it's, it's at times decoupling from what we're seeing in the West. So there's, there's becoming a little bit of a shift in um, where the price of some of these commodities are being sort of controlled or, um, you know, the dominant center of trade around some of these key commodities. And I think gold is partially starting to sniff that out too. You know, if there's an arbitrage opportunity, financial players are, pretty savvy at making the most of those and and you know so we, we from what we're seeing it seems like there's quite a significant there's been quite a significant shift of gold flowing from west to east in the last year year and a half hmm. um, and that trend seems to be accelerating um, so it, it's our view at the moment that it's central bank the current the recent action is central bank driven and it's not western um, it's 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 flowing the other way it's going one or multiple central banks in the in, in Asia um, is driving the bulk of this recent action. Do you, do you so, think that the recent happenings in, in the Middle East though are going to be short-lived or are they just going to add fuel to that fire of central banks buying in the East? I, I mean, it all depends on if this escalates, right? Um, you know, I'm not a Middle Eastern geopolitical expert. Um, based on recent, you know, based on past, these things, Usually nine out of 10 times, they're fairly short-lived. Um, you know, the fact that over the weekend, it kind of, it, it seemed a bit choreographed to me, just sitting here in my armchair watching it all. Um, it, it did look a bit kind of, I don't know, there's something didn't quite pass my sniff test as the beginning of a major escalation. Um, so to, to my mind, at, at the moment, you know, subject to change if something really escalates, um, I think I think the near-term Middle East stuff could end up being, I don't want to call it a storm in a teacup. It's more than that. But um, at the moment, I don't think it's going to be a major driving force. I think some of these other factors are going to, um, specifically with gold. Uh, but, you know, you look at you look at oil today and stuff like that. I mean, if this really was about to really go hammer and tong, major conflict, I would have expected to see more, more movement in some of these other commodities that are going to get disrupted from a major conflict. Um, so the market right now is telling us it's not a major at the moment, at least, um, yeah. How long do you expect the, um, the the buying pressure from the east to continue? Though, like, is is this a something happening in a vacuum, or is this more of a transition away from the dollar and into more hard assets? Yeah, I mean that's the that's the pertinent question, right? Um, and I, the answer is no one knows. But my gut is this is a pretty this has been a pretty significant move. Um, this is basically a major buyer pinning their ears back and taking whatever physical they can get their hands on, um, which to me suggests it's, it's probably more likely the start of a sustained move. Um, if it really is a structural shift you know, from a significant group of countries away from the dollar that, that everyone's been talking about for a long time, right? It's not a new concept. Um, the whole BRICS and, you know, de-dollarizing world's been, been a topic for years and years. Um, but, this recent action looks a bit more like a concerted coordinated type of move. Um, my gut is that it 
this is probably a, a longer term move than a shorter term move. I'm very interested to see price action wise what happens on the first major pullback. We've kind of broken out and gone vertical for three or four weeks now. We haven't really had our first test of is there really sustained demand, you know, at key crucial levels below this breakout level. Um, and if so, if we end up you know, six months down the line and, you know, $21, $2,200 is the new floor. And whenever price gets down there in gold, there's a wave of buying comes out of the East. Um, I think that's a pretty good sign. So I'm, I'm watching very closely for this, you know, the, the first major pullback we get. Um, the, the other thing I'm watching closely is, I mean, it, it kind of blows my mind that this rally has happened with such lackluster demand out of the West. I mean, it's not even lackluster demand. I mean, you know, there is, there's been hemorrhaging of capital out of, you know, vehicles like GLD, you know, for, for those of you with charts that can pull up a chart of the shares outstanding of GLD, just go look at that. I mean, it's been in a downtrend for four years, just, and this breakout to new all time highs, it, it's barely blinked. There's been a week or two here and there where there's been minimal inflows, but it's pretty much continued on trend. So I can't remember the last time there was a, you know, major asset class with a big, massive break, breakout that's still seeing outflows. You know what I mean? So the, another question I have is what happens when, if the West finally wakes up and jumps on the bandwagon? Um, you know, you've, you've had this whole move to, you know, a somewhat historic breakout in the gold price with zero participation from Western institutions. You know, it's, 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 quite, it's quite an interesting setup. It's, it's on, on the one hand, you're sort of wondering, is this, is this real? Is this buying out of what we think is likely an Eastern central bank or multiple central banks, how much ammo do they have? Um, you know, is it sustainable on, on, from their side? And the other angle you've got, will the Western investors and institutions wake up and kind of jump on and add fuel to the fire? Um, so we'll see. Um, you know, the, these kind of historical breakouts, though, you know, putting on my technical analysis in a, in a um, historic or historian hat, you know, when you get these sort of massive breakouts from decade plus ranges, they tend to be, they tend to be pretty meaningful. Um, you know, I think back to the NASDAQ breaking out of it's 20, what well, it was, it was, I think it took 17 or 18 years for it to break above its 2020 high, right? People forget that, right? The, the tech boom in the 2000s, um, that high was not surpassed for 17 years. Um, and, and then it went, I think it's up, three or four X from that breakout point. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so those kind of big, massive, I mean, gold's not a small asset class, right? It's a massive global, uh, meaningful asset class. And to have that kind of a breakout um, that's been decades or, or a decade or more in the making, um, to me is usually a pretty powerful, pretty powerful signal. You said you're going to be looking for pullbacks and potentially adding on those pullbacks. Um, if I were to make you put back your technical hat on what, how, how, how long are these pullbacks? How big are they? How far does it go back? Yeah, I mean, well, that's what I'm watching. Um, you know, if, if, if we can hold above that, that breakout level, which let's just call it, you know, the 2070, 2022 peak, you know, if, if we saw a massive whack below that, you know, I'd probably have to rethink some things. Um, but I think, you know, the first portal calls usually always can it hold that previous re previous resistance that becomes support um you know if that can happen if we can hold 2070 2100 i think that's a really really bullish sign um you know how long could it last i mean i'm hoping it's kind of a few, whenever it comes you know maybe we're in the early stages of it now um you know a few weeks to a few months you know what i mean if, if this if the correction lag drags on for a year or more you know again i'll probably have to think about it but if this is a, a bona fide proper range breakout um, on a major, major technical pattern. My gut is the first retracement's not going to be, you know, six months to a year. It's going to be a couple of months, two or three months max, and probably a few weeks to a month, maybe six weeks. Mm. It's just my gut based on looking at these things in the past. I'd like to share your optimism, and, and I, I typically do, and it only makes sense for me to do so given the intellectual disparity between the two of us. But most of my buddies who stare at their portfolios 24-7, even while they're supposed to be working, and see their juniors at all-time lows might not agree with you. And um, this is where a, a chart shared by Garrett Gogging on uh, Twitter this week confirms that sort of 
for me, and it was it was showing the disparity between the Huey Goldbug Index and uh, that'll be in orange, by the way, on people's screen right now, and also the price of gold in blue. So basically, the stocks are not following, right? The stocks are not agreeing. And th there is an argument to be made here that they, they that they are cheap, but then there's also the argument to be made that they're maybe cheap for reasons. Specifically, gold produces a cheaper reason, given that the, their margins have not been following the gold price to the upside. Either what has been following the gold price to the upside, though, and even outperforming it, has been the number of shares outstanding. So what sort of side on the argument would you be on here? Like, Are gold stocks cheap or are they cheap for a reason? It, it's a great question, and I get asked this a lot, and it's one of my favorite topics, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I mean, gold is very different to mining equities or gold mining equities, right? They're, they're two very different things, you know, Rick always says, you know, my old boss, Rick Rule, you know, if you own, if, if you bullish gold, own the gold stocks first. That's your prime form of insurance. It's, you know, much less volatile. It's, it's, you know, we, we feel everyone should have at least a small portion of their investment portfolio allocated to gold. The miners are the greed trade on that, you know, the, the levered supposedly um, way to really make the most of all phases in the gold price. Um, I get a lot of people, you know, clients, random people asking me, well, look, gold's now above its high and let's just say 2020, um, yet, you know, the GDX is still down 20 something percent from that peak level at higher gold prices. You know, that makes no sense. They're so cheap. Um, as you point out, you know, we have, we've had a big inflation wave, right, over the last three or four years. I mean, we've seen measurable, we've measured somewhere between, you know, 7 to 10% per annum increases in mining costs over the last four years so you know if you look at sort of mid to large cap miners you know pre-covid there were average oil and sustaining costs around about a thousand bucks an ounce it's it's rounded to a thousand bucks an ounce you know now you're looking at 1350 maybe 1400 dollars um so i think now with 2.3k gold you probably can if, if you want to take a snapshot in time you can you can now just in the last week if you want to make a like for like comparison, you know, it, it say let's just say 1350 gold and you know, 1350 all in sustaining costs. The margins are about the same today as the peak in 2020, all else being equal. We'll, we'll have to wait for probably Q2 um, financial reports to come out to confirm that we haven't had any more cost escalation. Um, but as of right now, you know, I think you can make a case the gold stocks have lagged in a quote unquote cheap. You know, maybe are they pricing in a near-term gold price correction? Probably. You know, I think, you know, I think in reality, though, like you said, the space has been so beat up for so long, it's going to take a fair amount to get people interested and excited about this space again. You know, I mean, I've, I've been living and breathing this space for, you know, almost a decade now with Sprott. Um, and, you know, there's been some very trying times. You know, it's it's been a, a mentally tough space to you know, live and breathe every day for 10, 12 hours a day. Um, there's, there's no two, two ways about it. Um, and those sort of tough times, those sort of bear markets, they don't change, they don't flick a switch overnight, right? Um, so there's, there's definitely a sentiment component to why they're all lagging. There's definitely been a um, margin problem. You know, the cost of, cost of producing gold has gone up. There's no two ways about that. Um, you know, um, you you want to own miners when there's you know there's an inflection point and there's and that margin expands. You know what I mean? And it's you don't know. You know, there's a, there's a lot of arguments around whether you should buy and hold miners. I think I think there is long periods of time where you should hold them, but they're definitely not something you sit and forget in your portfolio for twenty years and never look at them again, right? There are times to own them, and there are times when owning them becomes more risky. Ironically, the best time to own them is when you hate them, when no one wants to touch them, when you feel like vomiting, when you look at your portfolio. And I would argue the last couple of years has been plenty of moments like that, I can tell you. Um, you know, because they look, you buy mine, it's not just gold mine, it's copper, it's, you know, pick, take your, pick your commodity. If you look back through the cycles, the best time to buy them is when they look the worst, ironically. When they have the worst margins is, is, is usually around, commodity price cycle lows and when they look fantastic like again 2020 right we had a about a thousand dollar average all in sustaining cost margin looking back happened to be a four-year peak when they were the most profitable in a decade you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so 
it's kind of weird. It's it, mining's a weird space like that. Um, but you know, I could argue, I can make an argument based on history that the last couple of years have been some of the look, looking back may end up being some of the best time to pick up the sector um, for the next decade or two. Um, so yeah, as, as spot in time right now, margins have or should have, you know, really ramped up in the last six to six to twelve weeks. Hmm. Um, and I, if if this twenty three hundred level can hold, and if inflation can even hold seven eight percent per annum, um, I, I think miners are looking quite attractive on a cash generating metrics right now. Hmm. Now within that, the mining sector is very. Um, there are companies you want to own and there are companies that even at high gold prices, like you say, are going to dilute you to oblivion. They don't know what they're doing or they just, they're running the company for themselves. There's, there are a lot of landmines in this space. If you don't know what you're doing. And even if you know what you're doing, you know, you take on risks, risks sometimes bites. Um, if you're playing in a risky space, that's just how it works. Um, but the, the, the dilution part is a very important argument. I think, I think it's, it, it's a huge part of the game because that, again, that same guy, Garrett Gogging, had that had this this chart in the same thread showing that while the gold price is now over five times higher um, than it was before I was kind of born in in the um, I was born not kind of born I hope I was fully born but so <laughs> I was born in the mid 90s um, the number of shares outstanding for the miners has ro has has risen over nine times since there was the gold price only five times right and so the EPS has naturally have declined over time sort of perpetually even though we have had cycles in between right. And um, so yeah, what do you? I mean, what do you? What do you? What do you do with that? Is that something you use to to pick the right companies to own? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you know, you just have to know what you own. You have to be very specific about what you own. You know, you have to be aware of that factor. You know, like high high cost miners, for example, when that when you're in that really ripping phase where the gold and or silver price is absolutely going parabolic. Those companies, ironically, do the best during that phase because they go from losing money and diluting you to looking like superstars, right? And the, so the, the intrinsic value of the company goes from negative to massively positive. However, you know, if you're going to play that game, you've just got to be very aware that this is a these are high cost miners. That when the cycle turns, they're going to be the ones that you know go from being profitable to not profitable for the fastest, and you're going to get diluted to oblivion if you don't step out of the way so you know i'm not advocating buying leveraged high cost names but you know there are a time and a place where they can really juice your portfolio but the risks are huge um if, if you focus more on the very very best and there are very you know i would say there's one percent or less of of the of the universe is fits in this category um you know and you you invest in companies that are either not going to dilute because they're going to be cash flow positive throughout the cycle or management is savvy, know what they're doing and are going to make acquisitions that are accretive to the business. So you dilute, but you add more value than you dilute. Mm. Um, you know, you'll be, you'll be much more, you'll have a much better outcome than if you, you know, just buy the, whatever people are screaming about on X or whatever is the latest and greatest um, and hold for too long and get burnt by dilution. Cause the sector as a whole is, it's about the most capital intensive sector you can get. Um, if you, if you don't, if you're not in the right place, you are going to get diluted and net net full cycle. You're probably going to not have fun. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I wish a, I had just... a dollar every time I heard a, a junior CEO tell me that they're doing something accretive, right? I, I, my portfolio would have been accretive by now if that was true. But... <laughs> well, the junior space is different to the miners too, right? I mean, the junior space, by definition, you know, they don't generate revenue. Um, there, or most of them don't, unless you're like a prospect generator or something like that. Yeah. Um, so you got to be extra careful, extra, extra, extra careful in the junior space. Um, you know, you've you've really got to either put your trader hat on and say I'm doing this, speculate on price moves or sentiment swings or whatever, or um, focus on the very best of the best, you know, like tier one companies. And even then tier one d discoveries developments with management that know how to play the capital markets and not just go hammer and tong, you know, spin, spin, spin through tough times. Um, you know, it, it's really, it's extra important to know what you're doing in the junior space. Cause yeah, you can really, you can really end up in a bad place <laughs> if you're not yeah, careful. You're right. 
You're especially like right. a market like the last few years, right? Um, mm. exactly. I, I, just, a, just a stat for you. I saw um, a stat out of the um, an aggregator, data aggregator that we follow in Australia that follows the all of the resource companies on the ASX. There's almost 900 companies in the universe. And in the last two years, sub 20 million market cap companies are down by about 60 something percent on average so if you had an index of juniors essentially you know small cap juniors the, the average of the index would have been down about 60 percent mm. in the last two years so that just goes to show you how how rough that junior space has been the last couple of years you know but basically as soon as the fled the fed hit the rate raising button mm. the, the, it's not just the junior miners either it's junior biotech it's Speculative, you know, just look at Kathy Woods's ARC fund, right? The poster child of the speculative excesses. I mean, you can literally put the date the Fed started raising rates in the stock chart and it's all the speculative sectors, the bottom just fell out of them. So, yeah, she's got robot taxis working for her, though, so she, she's going to be okay. But, I, <laughs> but, but you're right, though. And then, you know, I talk to Rick a lot, too, and he often says, um, you're either a contrarian or you will be a victim. That's sort of one of his his top quotes there. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's actually worse for the micro for, you know, in, in micro cap land where I typically vacation, because we're like, if you, if you, if you chart the GDX or the SILJ to their respective underlying metals prices, you see an even bigger gap than what we're seeing with the huge, right? But because with the juniors, then again, it's, it's, it, again, it's way worse because the price of their shares is the price of their money. Essentially, it's right? the cost of capital basically. Yeah. Yep. So if you go into a depression in the junior mining space, like we've had the last few years, I think it has been borderline depression in the space. You just can't do anything. And that it creates like a doom loop, right? Because if you can't raise money in an accretive manner, you can't do anything, which reduces interest. You, your price goes even further. You know what I mean? Um, it, yeah. it, it does create kind of a, there's a feedback loop there during really bad times. And at some point they just get the risk reward gets so good that you know, intelligence speculators step in um, and pick up the, the very best. Usually that corresponds with the pickup in the underlying commodity space. Um, and then capital eventually trickles down to the junior space and you have a, a virtuous style for, for a while where the opposite happens. Um, but yeah, net, net, you got to be very careful in the junior space. You know, um, you know, we, you know, just the nature of the market the last 10 years, we, we still will, do, you know, our bread and butter is still picking the very best of the best in the junior space. But, you know, we have had to go up market in the mining space in the last 10 years because it's been a very different market the last 10 years than in the 2000 to 2012 space. Um, we, you know, there was a vir there was a virtuous cycle. And, you know, I, I wasn't around, but I've heard stories of, you know, companies that raise money um, and the market rejoices because now they've got money to go and drill, which is going to bring news flow, which is going to move the share price higher, right? So like financings were almost viewed as positive and the price would go up, right? Like that hasn't happened in my almost 10 year career with Sprott. <laughs> so that's yeah. exactly what I wanted to bring up because of another thing that you shared on Twitter this week. It was it came from Michael Horner, by the way, so just shout out to him. Um, it was showing that specifically gold projects are not necessarily being drilled at any any serious tempo, if you will. So the number of drilled gold projects in uh, March fell to about 82 projects in total, which is an eight-year low, apparently. And obviously, gold was not doing what it's doing now back in March. And this this price is, is hopefully going to, you know, bring a lot of um, a lot of characters from the woodwork here. But so my question here would be basically twofolded. Um, is, is this what the juniors need in order to wake up from the dead, sort of more more assay results, um, but then also given the state of the financing market, it, it, can they really ramp up in any meaningful way? Well, drilling costs money, right? So if you've got no money, you can't do anything. Mm. Um, and and like you said, the junior space is maybe starting to awaken, but we, we still haven't seen a whole lot of money raised yet. So there's always a lag with this sort of stuff, right? I mean, again, Rick's, I'm sure you've had Rick on your show or, or other podcasts talk about this. You know, typically the majors, when, when commodity prices start moving, there's usually the majors move first and the intermediates and then small cap miners and it'll trickle down to the juniors, right? So the juniors, are, when juniors are starting to go parabolic, it's usually later in the cycle and we, we're not there yet. We haven't seen it. So right now it's, it's kind of wild, right? I mean, the gold price is, is ripping and then I look at my news aggregators for drill results every morning and it's like, the lowest amount of drilled results I've seen across my screen in a long, long time. Whereas if you go back about two years, even though the gold price was starting to roll over and 
times were, you know, prices were dropping. Companies had raised a whole bunch of money back in 2020 when the, when we did have sort of 18 months where things did pick up. Um, and so there's a lag between the time frame of when companies can, when commodity prices starting moving to when companies can raise money to when that money then funnels into drilling. Um, so you, I, mean, I don't have any specific data to correlate with this, but I'd be almost certain there's probably an 18 month to two month lag between a commodity price moving off a low to a peak in junior drilling activity. Somewhere between 12 and 24 months would be my guess um, between between those. So, you know, and, and for example, I, I remember, I vividly remember, I think it was 2021, might've even been 2022, but there was a record amount of junior mining IPOs and RTOs on the ASX. in I think it was 2021, you know, about a year after the um, gold price peak. And, and, you know, there was, again, there was a lot of animal spirits flying around the speculative markets in general in 2021 so that probably contributed contributed to it too um but yeah it just goes to show you how you know how it, how it all lags and the sequence of events so right now still not a lot of financing at the junior end very little drilling unless you were the best of the best i mean if you're the if you were really tier one um if you're a bona fide genuine discovery there's money for you out there there's money in that space right now um if you're pre-discovery, if you're a sort of a gameplay leveragey, whatever it is, it's very hard to raise money. And mm. first, to be honest with you, I don't mind that. I think I think I think you, we could lose 60, 70 percent of the junior companies out there, and it would benefit the sector because it'd be less less. There'd be more concentrated in the better plays, right? There's a lot of lifestyle companies. There's a lot of crap out there um, that should go away, and I and I hope there is a little bit more of a um what is it called creative destruction you know what i mean <laughs> that's what do what you capitalism look for works, but, yeah. when you when you try to to see the ones that you do like actually that small percentage of companies are you you're looking the ones that have capital and are drilling right now or or i mean what, what specifically do you look for here there's a, there's a combination of things i mean first and foremost the geology right i mean you can have the best run company in the world if they don't have a deposit or you know it doesn't really matter um so the first thing we look for, um, especially in this market, as a genuine discovery or, or something that looks to us like it's there's this has got a, either a really solid tier two or tier one. I mean, tier one discoveries are just so rare these days that kind of almost strong tier two is almost the new tier one. Um, uh, but yeah, so we look for something spectacular that looks like it's got a very good chance of becoming a bona fide world class discovery. Um, and then you start drilling, you know, drilling down into the management. Um, you know, management's hugely important. Um, you know, Rick is famous for saying you back the serially successful entrepreneurs because they have they have a knack for doing it over and over again. So if you can get really, really good management um, that know what they're doing, know how to play capital markets, um, then that's another box tick. You know, right at this juncture, do they have capital? You know, if, if a company is going to need to raise money even if they've got a good discovery and a good project, you know, it's it's always nice to not have to have that financing overhang affecting the, the share price. Um, they're all, they all are going to need to raise money at some point, but if, if I'm entering something new, um, you know, are, are they going to need to raise money? Um, but if I'm in an existing project, it doesn't have the quality of, of deposit and management that I'm willing to back them, you know, and I'm confident that the dilution I'm going to experience is going to be dwarfed by the value add. That's the key. You know, dilution is fine as long as it's adding value. As long as, as long as the race between dilution and, and value add and, and value creation is in your favor, dilution isn't the end of the world. Mm. It, you just have to make sure it's not, you're not paying for someone's holidays to Nantucket or whatever, right? You, you want to make sure it's, <laughs> it's being spent well. Yeah. And, and, and I would say, and I can probably count on one hand the number of projects that fit that bill for each commodity. You know, some some less than that. You know, there are some commodities where there's one or two projects that we genuinely think fit that fit in that bucket. Mm, that's so, true. Kind of hard these days though, because you have conferences all over the place, so you don't know if they're going on vacation or going on a conference, um, <laughs> or a combo uh, of both. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, most of the times. Um, but no, you're right. Um, we we haven't talked a lot about copper. I know you almost have to go here in a couple of um, 
minutes. We we mostly talk about gold and silver and how all that is influencing gold and silver, but copper is a very very economically sensitive metal. Um mm -hmm. quite elastic. Um what do you what do you make of copper right now? It's got a good move, but we're what's happening? Yeah, copper is you know, precious metals we're obviously known for our precious metals exposure historically, but I would say copper is probably one of the commodities I'm most bullish on if you've got a 10 year horizon. Um, you know, it's held up remarkably well over the last few years with all the, you know, everyone's sitting around waiting for this recession we were supposed to have that hasn't arrived. You know, copper's hung in there okay. Um, if you look at this purely at the supply side, it looks horrendous. If you're wanting to buy copper at a reasonable price, it looks mind-blowingly you know intriguing isn't it from the investment angle if you assume demand stays even flat you know out, again out on a 10-year time frame and there's just so many problems getting new projects over the line there is very very little in the way of new major tier one greenfields you know new mines coming online and um, you know we had Kamoa and Kakula Kamoa Kakula come on recently which was, was a big one but beyond that there's like there's just not much happening everyone's probably you know familiar with what's going on in Panama you know, two percent of global supply, just one and a half to two percent just offline overnight. You know, every year for the last three years, you know, the analyst consensus at the start of the year has been for small to modest surpluses on the year in terms of primary supply. Every year they've been knocked back into a deficit or close to it. And already this year, I mean, about six months ago, we were hearing, you know, four, five hundred thousand tons surplus for twenty twenty four. Now we're looking at 700, five, five to 700,000 ton deficit, you know, and we're only a quarter of the way through the year. So, you know, all, all bets are off if the world implodes. And like you said, it is a very economically sensitive metal. But barring, you know, even even in even in, uh, even in in uh, 2007, eight global financial crisis, you know, I, I don't think world copper demand reduced. Um, mm. I'd have to look at the data, but I think it was basically flat. So you'd have to have something materially worse than that to see global copper demand meaningfully reduce and decline systemically. So unless you think there's a future of a systemic uh, decreases in demand for copper, I think you want to have some copper in, in your portfolio. Um, caveat being the equities have kind of done the opposite to the gold price, the gold equities, and that they've held up and almost outperformed. So on a spot basis, they look a little bit expensive right here, right now, pricing in, say, four dollar $4 copper. Um, so, you know, I think if you're looking for value, there's two ways of looking at it, right? You're either a value or a long-term value or you're a momentum trader. If you're a momentum trader, you, yeah, the copper equities have been much better than the gold equities. If you're a pure out-and-out -out value investor, I think the gold equities look cheaper here today than the copper equities. Hmm. But I think... I think you're going to want some copper in your portfolio over the next 10 years. Um, all the usual caveats, volatility, rah, rah, rah. Uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be up and down. But copper, the, the outlook for copper looks good. But, but given the sort of the macro background that we've discussed here of uh, fiscal dominance and the, the issues in the Middle East and then the, the buying or, or the rotating from the dollar into maybe hard assets in the East – would the dynamic that's been true through last cycles where it was what's good for gold is not necessarily good for copper what, what, is that going to stay around or is that going away well i mean just look at look at copper and gold through the 2000s super commodity super cycle right they were they both went nuts um you know copper went from i think it was 50 cent lows to 450 you know it went up 9x um so i don't necessarily think what's good for one is bad for the other i think when there's certain structural dynamics in play you know, fiat loses against all hard assets, right? Um, so, you know, and, and we've seen in the past as well, I mean, not everyone in, can get their hands on a whole pile of gold when it's really in demand. So something like copper almost becomes a store of value in itself. You know, we, we're seeing inventories, warehouse inventories in Shanghai, for example, um, go up quite a bit right now. And there's people speculating that, you know, there are big industrialists in China that are can see what's going on there and are just, you know, trying to buy copper as an alternative to gold for storing storing their wealth, basically. Um, I don't know if that's happening or not, um, but that has certainly happened in the past. Um, copper's a little, little bit easier to get get your hands on than gold, especially when it's when demand's really, really, really high. Um, so I, I, I think in the end with fiscal dominance, whatever it happens with war in the Middle East, just continuation of 
what we're seeing in Western and in all places around the world, frankly. I think commodities are the benefit and other hard assets are going to go up in fiat terms. Whether they go up in purchasing power terms is another question, but I think they're going to be a reasonable place to you know, preserve your purchasing power. And, and usually when you get into that kind of environment, they overshoot, right? And you end up, as long as you don't fall in love and hold it, think you're going to hold it for 20 years, you know, that you can have five to 10 good years where they do more than preserve your purchasing power, which I think mm. is what I think we're on the cusp of here. There's just an added layer of complexity to copper here, in my opinion, because it's, well, to a lot of commodities, but specifically to copper, and that's transportation, right? Um, and then because of metal density, it's kind of different than with gold, whereas with transportation, like there could be enough copper above ground, but if it gets blocked in Peru and then it, it doesn't leave on time for China, and it's sort of at the tip of Africa or, like the, the, you know, in, in South Africa, but it should be in China and it's getting delayed, then prices could make, you know, sort of unpredictable moves over the short term. Do you, I mean, do you, do you account for transportation issues? Have you started paying more attention to transportation given the issues in the Middle East? Um, a little bit. I mean, it all goes into the cost of production and, and the cost, you know, a, a, you know, the attractiveness of, and then the price people are willing to pay for, for the end user. I think... To be honest, I think the West is more at risk of like supply disruptions and than the, than the East is right now. Um, you know, I mean, you look at domestic copper production out of the US, and and I mean, look at Europe. I mean, Europe's pretty much got near zero domestic production, right? So if 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 the nearshoring phenomenon really started to matter, like there was global conflicts, shipping lanes were shut down. Um, you know. I mean, the U.S. is probably in a better stance because they've got Mexico and, and South America relatively close. Um, you know, there's some of the biggest copper mines in the world right next door in Mexico. Um, so I think the U.S. would be better than Europe. Um, but like Europe would be screwed, you know. <laughs> it's like they've just they've they've no they've had no interest in growing their extractive industry for decades. Um, you know, it could you could see you you could start to see regional pricing disparities that weren't arbitrageable. Um, because of either the cost of transportation or just the complete inability to transport, that could get really interesting. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, I think someone like China, you know, I'm just thinking this through, but you know, there's this. I think someone like China would be less impacted than someone than a place like Europe in particular. Mm. So, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. I, it's not something that's probably first and foremost on our the way we look at it right now, but it, it is a kind of a risk that could really matter at some point. Right now, there's just a shortage of, of concentrate. There's a shortage of the primary, you know, form of copper. If, if, you know, like if you look at the treatment charges, the Chinese copper smelters are charging to process concentrate right now. I mean, it's very, it's historical lows because they just can't get their hands on concentrate. There's been a big ramp up in smelter capacity and there's been a big decrease in the amount of, concentrate available so they're almost doing it for free at the moment um which is you know quite interesting and gives you some insight into how tight suppliers out there yeah for sure what, what else is is top of the list for you though i um yeah i said i'm gonna let you go a, a while back and i keep coming up with questions but maybe this is the last one what am i uh what, what else are you paying attention to what, what else caught your eye this week I'm starting, I'm watching, the most thing I'm watching most closely at the moment is Western flows in and out of commodity related themes. Usually the easiest way to do it is to track ETF flows, just because that's how investors in the West these days tend to express themes. You know, like I said, GLD has been hemorrhaging, uh, you know, the shares outstanding in the GLD is just it's dropped by over a third since their peak in 2020, which is quite a significant drop. Um, what is interesting is that um, the mining ETFs have just started to not not a lot, but the mining ETFs have actually had inflows over the last six months, while the physical itself has been flowing out. So I find that quite interesting. There's not enough of a trend there to really read too much into it, but it's certainly a watch closely kind of moment. Um, you know, if you think you know big money sort of positions themselves and vehicles that are going to have the most talk to to a change in another factor like the gold price for example you know it makes sense that you'd be buying up the leverage if you if you were fairly confident there was going to be a step change in the underlying it doesn't always work that way i've seen cases where flows into mining etfs preceded big moves i've seen cases where it hasn't but it is it is an interesting thing i'm watching um 
yeah, the, the biggest thing I'm waiting for is a, is if and when the West, the Western institutional pools of capital decide that or wake up to the space, because um, I think there could be a catch up trade. You know, people talk about the catch up trade, and you know, earlier on our our gold mine is under undervalued. Um, I think they're just on the cusp of fundamentally being undervalued now. You know, a, a year ago, I don't. I think you could make the case that they weren't, but I think they are just starting to become you know, noticeably undervalued to their earnings at $2,300 gold. And I'm waiting and watching for signs that that Western capital is showing up in the space. Because when you think about it, I mean, if, it's, if this really is Eastern central bank buying driven at the moment, central banks don't buy miners, right? So that partially explains the, why the mining space has been left for dead because the pool of capital driving the move doesn't, doesn't even think about mining companies, right? The pool of capital that focuses on mining companies has been exiting, has been flowing out of GLD. Um, so that's what I'm keeping close tabs on. There's some green shoots. Um, so I'm I'm feeling optimistic um, after a couple of, couple of really tough years. Um, but yeah, it's it's starting to inflict, I think, knock on wood. So. <laughs> I think it, there's going to be a time where a lot of people are going to uh, dig up that old Doug Casey quote that says uh, something about sucking the contents of the Hoover Dam through a paper straw when that money starts coming in. The, the space is so small and bombed out, right? I mean, I look at, I got a couple of young mates in the crypto space, you know, and they're posting these things about how XYZ coin, you know, only has a, you know, $50 billion market cap now. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I think the whole uranium equity mining space is probably sub 40 billion or something, right? Like, 30. Yeah, it's 30. Yeah, yeah. So it's like when guys are talking about meme coins having market caps only, you know, twice the size of a major extractive industry, like it shows you how small our space has become. You know, it's, it's, it's almost mind blowing that Exxon was like the second or third, or maybe it was the lar- I think it was the largest company in the world at the turn of 20 of the two decades ago. So 2010. It was the largest company in the world and went from that to being pushed out of the S&P 500 <laughs> right at the COVID lows. Like that's how small the space has gotten um, over the last 12, 13 years. Um, hmm. You know, it is a cliche, but it is so small now that it's not going to take, it's not going to take every man and his dog waking up and wanting to own Barrick or Newmont, right? It's just going to take a small fraction of a, of a small part of the investment community wanting some exposure to the space. And it, it could have quite, substantial impact on you know on prices and demand mm. so we'll we'll see there's always a lot of risk caveat and all that sort of stuff you, people the last few years have experienced more of the realization of risk than the, the reward but i'm seeing some green shoots that the reward part of that cycle's starting to starting to come close so yeah well thank you thanks so much i um I agree, and I really appreciate the overview here, Sam. This was a this was a blast, and I appreciate your time. Hopefully, we can do it again soon. Hopefully, I can host you, host you on the old world. What are we gonna call this? I have to think about it. Anyways, for people listening, it is Sam Broom on Twitter or at the Nude Investor, which I now realize I should have asked you to explain yourself, Sam. But next time. Because uh, right now I'm jumping over to the CEO barbecue segment of this report because I have three CEOs waiting to talk to me, but I won't talk to them before I let you know that. I don't hate you. Resource Talks doesn't hate you, and therefore, I want you to know that I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never made serious money in the space. Please don't consider me any type of authority here. Um, you can try and ask about my picks. Uh, just don't, maybe. <laughs> don't ask what I think of your favorite stock. Don't ask me whether I'm buying or selling. Um, in a couple of years' time, when and if I build a track record, I'll start talking more about them. But for now, you really have no value in asking about that. And although none of the companies that you see on here today have paid me to include them in this week's CEO barbecue, and although um, a couple of minutes of research at least have gone into this, and although I don't share questions up front and I don't give the companies editing rights, you should still be skeptical of everything you see in here. Uh, These are going to be general and impersonal private conversations between two talking heads on the internet, so it only makes sense for you to approach this with caution. And if you don't like losing money if you don't like sleeping on a couch. You should also head over to setterplus.ca where you find the company's official filings and you want to eat, breathe them, bake them in the oven, and then talk to a professional investment advisor, ask them what they think about it. 
before taking your own decision in the end, because this space is a high risk industry. Um, it's a high risk industry to deploy capital in, and you should be cautious. Obviously, forward looking statements that's in your screen right now. Um, you should really pay attention to what what's written on there and better understand what the risks are of this um, uh, of, of this space as a whole. Because for now, as you can hear, I'm stuttering, so that might be a good idea to start. Moving on, um, I'll be kicking it off by traveling to a jurisdiction that I don't typically spend a lot of time in, and you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but that might change after this interview because this is Japan. I'm going to be looking for gold, copper, and silver in Japan with John Wilton and uh, Derek Iwanaka of B Metals Corp. Uh, B Metals Corp is a company that's listed on the TSXV, so obviously in in um in Canada the ticker symbol would be B met so that'd be B M E T where an average of about um i want to call it 45,000 shares trade each day with a 52 week high of 19 and a half cents and a 52 week low of 6 and a half cents with a market cap of about 16 million dollars and about 177 million shares outstanding today this is a 9 cent stock you can add to that the 17 million options and you're going to be left with 215 and a half million fully diluted shares, which may sound a little bit strange. And although I certainly am no math genius, that doesn't sound right indeed. But that's mainly due to a 5.3 million convertible debt note that B Metals has with B2 Gold, which well, that's going to become clear or more clear in a minute here, hopefully. Um, about a fifth of the company, so that'd be 20% of the company, is owned by management and directors. Another almost fifth of the company, well, technical 19%, of course, is owned by B2, and institutions own about 14% of the company, leaving less than half of the shares in the hands of retail investors. Looking at the last interim financial statement, which is dated September 30, the company had about $3.2 million in current assets, most of which, so $2.8 million in actual cash, uh, as well as some account receivables and prepaid expenses on top of that as well. Um, on that September 30, the balance sheet showed a convertible debt. As I said, there's uh, there's that, and it's it's set at $2.2 million, and there was also a loan of $6.8 million, as well as some account payables for total liabilities of $9.2 million. That same statement tells me that B Mental spent, on average, over that last uh, reported nine-month period, about $140,000 per month on uh, what I would call g and so that would be your office rent, marketing salaries, and so on and so forth. As to the project expenses, the financials say that they spent about $508,000 on advancing the projects, leaving the project G&A, uh, the, the project to g and cost ratio at roughly four, which means that g and represented less than 20% of the overall cost here. But just as, as it always is, please remember that this is only a snapshot of a nine-month period in time. So please head over to the company's website as well as centerplus.ca to look at the most up-to-date financial numbers instead of ta taking my word for it. Because, yes, even gingers make mistakes sometimes. As we have determined already, accounting is uh, indeed very fun. But what's even more fun is Japan. Or so I'm told. I've never been. Maybe one day. But B Metals has. They've been there since 2021, actually. And that's when they acquired a portfolio of what I could count to be five pieces of land, pretty much on um, both ends of the country, south and uh, north. Surprising, though, you might think, uh, looking for metals in Japan. But Japan is actually on the ring of fire, just like Peru is, just like Chile is, and so on and so forth. And they're both historic and currently operating gold mines here. Um, again, uh, quite a few projects, so five projects. I'm not going to go through all of them one by one. Um, the Caddo Gold Project is the most advanced one. as uh, they, they, they have quite a lot of historical drill holes on it too, showing that this is an epithermal vein system, which uh, the company says is starting to look a lot like the style of mineralization that's that that's feeding the Hishikari Gold Mine, um, active gold mine in Japan, by the way. So although the grades are still to show up in any comparable ways, they, they, they have at Hishikari, and there, there's some... Um, Highlights of recent drilling that I can go through here uh, at Cato. They were showing six and a half meters of 1.8 grams of gold and 5.4 grams of silver. There was five and a half meters of 3.3 grams of gold and nine grams of silver, 13 and a half meters of 1.2 grams of gold and 18.3 grams of silver and so on and so forth. There's probably some stuff on your screen right now that you can see um as to what it is and also again go to the website to see for yourself and this is also by the way where the majority of the exploration budget that i told you about just a few minutes ago was spent on last year with uh, drilling at cato amounting to 2.3 million dollars for 
that nine month period, that'd be January through September last year. Uh, the other projects in Japan are, again, not as advanced, uh, not a lot of money going into them um, last year, but that will be discussed further on in the conversation as well. Most recent assays from one of them, by the way, that'd be the Todoroki, I, I believe that's how it's pronounced. They've um, come out already showing up to half a gram of gold per ton with further drilling here being expected to hit deeper within the interpreted extensions of the uh, historic mine that's present there. Hopefully hit some veins that hopefully can be higher grade than what, what's been found so far. The um, other project, though, that the company has been spending more money on is the Pengeni Copper Project in Zambia. This part of Zambia, by the way, is the western extension of the Central African Copper Belt, where uh, there are multiple copper mines that are operating today, including some of First Quantum's assets that you can probably see again on your screen now. This is a sandy place, though, that probably doesn't surprise you, although the sand cover on B Metals' ground is said to be only about 25 meters as opposed to 100 or, or plus meters in some of the other land packages in the area. Again, maybe needless to say, but I'll say it anyways because that's kind of how I am. They're looking for sedimentary ho hosted copper deposits here. B-Metals is 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 not drilling it alone, though, so they're not technically not looking for it alone. Jogmeg is involved in this story. They funded over $3 million Canadian dollars so far, had funded um, about $3 million Canadian dollars um, uh, up until late last year. And they cover about 28% of the exploration expenses here on a pro rata basis. Uh, all of the assay results from last year's drilling on this property have now been released, showing that copper mineralization is indeed present, although not high grade, but it does typically start at close to surface with uh, hole 14 showing 70 meters of 0.25% copper with um, mineralization and alteration here being traced for over one and a half kilometers or long strike with, um, well, B-Meadows basically thinks that that warrants further exploration as it is believed the geological fingerprint of what's been coming out of the ground here is similar to what Barrick has um, at their project, what what they've been pulling out of the ground at Lumwana, I believe it's called, which is also located again on the same copper belt. A new drill program is currently ongoing on this project. It's actually about halfway done as far as I understand it um, because it's only about 2,000 meters with final results here being expected by the end of this quarter. And this may be a good point for me to start shutting up and maybe kick off the conversation, uh, John and Derek, um, because while there is undeniably mineralization here in in, um, in Zambia, the grades are not amazing, right? 0.25% copper. You guys are also hoping that it, they're going to get um, higher, but but it, it could still work, right? Depending on the size, depending on the extraction cost, but also the continuity of this mineralization. So let's maybe kick it off there. Um Talk to me about that. How big can this thing get and how continuous are these types of deposits typically? Yeah, thanks for that uh, review, Antonio. Um, I think uh, one of the important things about our project in Zambia, the Pengeni project, as, uh, as you rightly call it, is that um, in addition to the last, last results we put out, which was D14C1, uh, uh, in January, we put out results from a whole D22C1 where we did intersect 18.1 uh, meters at uh, 0 0.7 uh, grams per ton. Um, sorry, uh, percent copper. Mm -hmm. So you know that's um, you know that's that's really a, a very interesting um, intersection because that's that's really what we would call in in Zambian terms an all grade intersection. And as you rightly po point out, um, that um, that uh, mineralization. It's very similar to what we see at Barrick's uh, large-scale Lomwana mine, which is about 160 kilometers um, to the uh, northeast of us. Um, average grades at Lomwana are about 0 0.56. The nearest mine to us is um, First Quantum's um, Sentinel mine, which is a grade of uh, 0 0.46. Um, they are both large-scale deposits. And in fact, at Lomwana, Barrick, um, Barrick Gold Corporation is now looking to uh, expand that operation into a, a super pit uh, and take that uh, copper production to over 200,000 tons per annum. So, mm -hmm. you know, really comparable in terms of uh, grade, especially on that intersection uh, D22C1. Uh, and as you rightly point out, what we're seeing around the higher grade intersections is this uh, envelope of lower grade min mineralization that comes to relatively shallow depths. Uh, and from a potential future economic extraction point of view, those uh, that sort of style of mineralization becomes more and more important. So we were so excited by the results from especially D22 C1 that uh, we um, we very quickly got board approval to start a um, 
follow-up drilling campaign that we um, that we started on the first of March. Um, our um, our twenty eight uh, our twenty seven point eight percent partners, Jogmec, which is a Japanese state agency, um, agreed to contribute uh, their their ongoing pro rata um, percentages to that um, exploration budget. Uh, and we're about halfway through that project. We've finished about three of the six holes. Um, and, um, you know, looking forward to being able to release those results as they come in, uh, probably early May uh, uh, and into June this year. How did how, how, how that partnership come to be, by the way? Is that related to you having assets in Japan or is it completely unrelated? Yeah, no, very good. Um, very good question. And, uh, and I can understand that people ask that question. Um, in fact, absolutely coincidental. Um, you know, we brought um, we brought first Japan, uh, Jogmec into our Zambian exploration. Uh, and then we subsequently, actually by coincidence, got involved in the gold uh, exploration in uh, in Japan. So that came came around, but obviously the um, strong relationship we've built both technically and financially with Jogmec, um, you know, that's very useful. Uh, I spend a fair bit of my time when we're active on our Japan gold exploration out in Japan. So that gives me the opportunity to update everyone face to face uh, on the copper results coming out of uh, out of Zambia, uh, and that's been a very good uh, very good working relationship. And reciprocally, we've um, we've hosted a number of the uh, Jogmec geologists involved in the project out to our project in uh, in Zambia, both out in the field and reviewing uh, drill core. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's a well, that's a I, I like hearing stories like that. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how that develops over time. Uh, to go back to Zambia, though, here for a second, as I mentioned, these things could work depending on on s scale and and continuity. Is there anything you can tell me about the continuity already, or is that too early to talk about? Yeah, so good question. Um, one of the things that we're seeing at uh, the drilling on our D prospect, specifically on which is a small area of the large Pengeni license. The overall license package is in excess of 700 square kilometers. Um, the D prospect is in the sort of northern central part of that license. So in exploration terms, we like to say you need space to find big deposits. So you need uh, area secured around that um, drill intersections. What we're seeing at um, the D prospect specifically is the hallmarks of what we call in Zambia basement hosted style of mineralization. So Lamuana is the type example uh, of that um, type of mineralization. As I mentioned earlier, grading about 0.56 um, large deposits. Um, the Lamuana mine itself uh, relates to basically two open pits, one called Melundui, one called Chimiwungu. Um, and um, you know they're both the same style of mineralization. And what we're seeing is the same sort of host rocks to the mineralization. And also importantly, from a geological point of view, I'm a geologist by background, um, we're seeing the same alteration minerals associated with that dominantly chalcopyrite mineralization. Um, mm. As we've explored the D prospect specifically, and that relates back to that intersection of uh, D22C1, we're also seeing a trend over that 1.5 kilometers of strike that you mentioned, where we're seeing an increase in the amount of a copper mineral called bornite in the southwestern part of the um, D prospect, which is very interesting because that would be something we can use as geologists to vector towards better grade parts of the, um, of the mineral system. And um, the more bornite we see, generally the happier we are. That means we're seeing generally higher grades. Um, so we're starting to understand what really is ticking at the D prospect, and that will lead to targeting, better targeting of our future drilling there. Hmm. What are mining and processing costs in that part of the world, by the way, from, from, from in the ground to sellable product, basically? How much money would it cost you to move a ton, a ton of ore or a ton of dirt? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, uh, mining costs in, uh, in Zambia are generally pretty competitive. Um, I would say the overall processing costs, we're looking at probably about um, $1.80 to $1.90, um, sort of uh, dollars, um, dollars uh, uh, somewhere, in that, in, somewhere in that ballpark. And, uh, you know, these, these mines, specifically the basement hosted ones, 
have got some sort of affinity to the large porphyry copper mines. You know, they're big bulk mining sort of operations. Uh, Lamuana utilizes a system of big conveyor belts to move material from the pits to the um, processing plant. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, they're also looking to expand to a super pit, which if everything goes to plan, that could go, you know, in excess of 300 to 400 meters in, uh, in depth ultimately. Wow. Um, and an important factor in that is, um, you know, Zambia is a, is a land link country. Um, there are improvements in infrastructure coming in uh, over time now. The work that's been done by various companies in the, in the adjacent uh, DRC, specifically Ivanhoe, um, you know, that's led to the uh, upgrading of a, a re new rail corridor, uh, which was really the upgrading of an existing uh, defunct system uh, out to the west through Angola, which will all improve the economics. Another important thing to remember in Zambia is that um, the cost of power is relatively competitive. Um, and also power predominantly comes from hydroelectric. So the copper that is produced in Zambia has got a good uh, green credential. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people these days talking about green copper. Um, the ideal scenario is um, producing copper in a, in a country where you're using power from uh, hydroelectric, for example. Um, and, you know, the fundamentals for copper, um, you know, I think most most viewers will be pretty open with. Um, but, you know, what's becoming increasingly important is that no matter what green transition, what battery technology ultimately ends up winning the race, as it were, um, copper is the foundation to all those green energy initiatives, whether it be wind farms or um, electric vehicles, um, you know, and um you know, there's been recent talk, you're probably well aware that, um, you know, it looks like there's going to be huge supercomputer type um, systems being built specifically in the USA, but they do consume a lot of power. And um, the um, grids in a lot of countries, including the US, needs a huge amount of upgrading and copper remains the most efficient way of uh, transmitting that power efficiently. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you the the to sort of go back to the 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 project again here in Zambia. That you mentioned that uh, Beric is thinking of going again four hundred meters deep on some occasions. On the cross section from the last reported results, it also seems like uh, four out of the five holes that you drilled stop at the sand contact, if you will, and only hole fourteen C one that would that would be I think continues at uh, at depth. How come? Yeah, so that's um, that's basically gets to the exploration methodology we've uh, we've sort of refined over the years on the on the Pengeni project, and a lot of that comes down to my history um, with a good friend and colleague um, working about uh, twenty years ago. Now we discovered a gold project in Namibia that led to the development of the Ochikoto gold mine, which was put into production by B two Gold. That's what kind of built my relationship with the B two team. Um, what we're doing is we're using geophysics at Pengeni to identify targets. Then we do shallow air core drilling, which is the other holes you've seen on those sections. The, the reason for those holes is just to punch through cheap drilling, punch through that sand cover, get bedrock geology and geochemistry. And that helps us target the diamond drilling or the core drilling. Mm. So D14C1, for example, is a core hole that's followed up on the anomalies generated below that sand cover from the shallow, um, you know, cheap uh, air core drilling. Right. Okay, sure. That makes sense. What is, um? you don't believe there's uh, football mineralization here, right? As, as far as I understand it? Um, it can be. We've, we've, we drilled a hole uh, D, um, D11C1 uh, off to the northwest, the northwestern most hole we've drilled. We think we're in the foot wall of the mineralized zone that we know to date. Um, but you've got to be very careful when you're exploring these systems. Bearing in mind here, that sand cover means we've got no outcrop to deal with. So we're putting all our geology together only from the shallow air core and the um, you know eight core drilling holes that we've got to date on this prospect. Hmm. So it, you have to be very careful when you talk about football being dead because it may be that there's another mineralized zone sitting deeper in the um, in the units there. But to date. Um, we sort of got that sort of central area, we think pretty well pinned down, and our initiatives have been extending the mineralization to the to the southwest, 
where we're seeing more bornite and potentially higher grades, uh, as we witnessed in uh, D22C1, uh, and also potentially to the east, where we're getting up into the hanging wall of the mineralization, where there might be other zones um, yet to be uh, discovered. Right. Well, I like surprises, especially when they're good surprise. Only when they're good surprises. Um, what is uh? It's Africa. I don't imagine core drilling is too expensive. What are, what are you paying per meter? Yeah, I use um, a drilling company that's uh, Zambian based. Uh, a company I've been involved in mineral exploration in Zambia now for more than twenty years. Um, I use a small um, Zambian private company and, um, you know, we get good drilling rates for them. Um, you know, costs are pretty much comparable with other places in the world. Depending on um, individual boreholes, we're probably ranging between about $180 to $200 per meter on, on average, which is very much in line, uh, considering that we're also in a relatively remote part of Zambia. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's part of the that's part of the challenge, exploring in these more remote areas. But because of that sand cover, you know, we're the first company to um, to really explore that exploration license. So we can honestly say that the mineralization and the potential on that license is really open to, um, to large scale. We know from analogies like the Moana and to a degree Sentinel, that when you do get onto one of these mineralized systems in general, um, you know, they can be very large and uh, and actually very strong copper mineralizing systems. You know, there are there are a number of world class, what you can truly say are world class deposits in uh, in in the Zambian copper belt. That word actually kind of annoys me a little bit. It gets banded around, um, you know, a, a little bit too frequently for my regards. You know, there's um there's a number of criteria that you can identify what we call tier one or tier two deposits. Hmm. But what sometimes gets forgetten, forgotten in uh, in Zambia is that um, you know a number of the historical mines in what we call the classical part of the copper belt, mines like in Changa, Mufalira, Konkola, you know they would all be um, world class deposits if they were discovered today. They're now aging assets. They're underground mines. They're getting further from the original infrastructure, so they've got a relatively high cost base. But if um, if you were to find one of those mines today, you would really be very, very happy. Um, and that's why, you know, the majors are all in Zambia, companies like Rio Tinto, Anglo-American, um, First Quantum, uh, you know, exploring and developing projects in uh, in Zambia. Can you talk to me maybe more about that, the sort of the geological comparison between you and some of these world class that you call or tier one deposits, and specifically from the perspective of 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 litho lith wow, that's a mouthful lithology, <laughs> alteration, structural controls, and and eventually uh, the the grade or of, of mineralization, and also like like what you just drilled, how does that compare to what you've previously compared it to in terms of geological comparisons? Yeah, sure. So to keep it relatively simple, there, there are effectively two types of sediment hosted deposits that we see in the Zambian and Central African copper belt as it extends up into the into into the DRC. Uh, one is hand, uh, one is hosted in a in a, a group of rocks that we call the uh, Katangan units. Um, they classically would have been what we call the ore shale deposits. So relatively narrow, but sometimes uh, very high grade deposits. So that will be um, that will be mineralization such that that private company Cobalt Metals, which is backed by um, Bill Gates and, and Jeff Bezos and others. That's a project that they're looking at right now uh, called Megombi. Um, that's relatively deep, uh, over 1,200 meters. But um, looking at a thickness of anywhere between five to 10 meters in, in thickness, um, but grades, you know, north of three and a half percent copper. Similar in a way to Ivanhoe's discovery, uh, now development project um, of uh, Kamoa Kukula in the western side of the copper belt up in the DRC. So they're the sort of high grade, relatively narrow, uh, often underground um, deposits. With the exception of Inchanga, was a was a large oxide open pitable as well, um, and then we get the style of mineralization as I mentioned earlier that we call it's still sediment hosted, but it's sediment hosted within basically the basement rocks. Yeah. Now we've drilled uh, good indications of both styles of mineralization 
on the Pengani license. But at the moment, we're getting the most interest and the most traction on that sort of basement hosted style. So our nearest analogy is uh, is Lamwana, which is um, you know which is uh, you know a large um, large mineral system development developed in the basement rocks. We see a lot of that mineral kyanite associated with basically chalcopyrite, and that's classic of what we now call the the domes regions um, within. Uh, within Zambia. So really, that's uh, Barracks and Moana mine, um, First Quantum's Constanchi mine, which really led to the foundation and the, and the real start of First Quantum, uh, and now First Quantum Sentinel deposit. Um, they're sort of all intimately associated in what we call the domes region of the Copper Belt. Hmm. What about, what about ore textures and, and your expectation for the metallurgy here? Do you think that's going to be comparable to Limwana as well? Yeah, look, these uh, the, the, the basement um, domes region deposits tend to be dominated by chalcopyrite, which is a very common uh, copper sulfide mineral. There's a huge amount of um, excellent experience within Zambia on uh, copper uh, metallurgy, um, you know, a huge amount of experience, probably potentially more than most places in the world. Um, so a very common copper sulfide. We do see some bornite coming in with the mineralization. Um, there is a little bit of um, of oxide in the in the shallower portions. We we know how to deal with those that combination of minerals in the um, in the copper belt and pretty pretty much off the shelf type um, metallurgy to be honest. Mm. So you're not going to need Bill Gates uh, nor Jeff Bezos to solve metallurgy here. We won't need that. I'd be very surprised if we did. <laughs> Gee, what about what about access to water? Bill Gates is is big on that too. You're going to need him to have access to water, or is that going to be okay? Yeah, look, um, you know, there's 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 quite a bit of water in uh, in Zambia in in general, surface water. In fact, some of the mines in the classical part of the Copper Belt, water can actually be, especially the underground mines, water can be one of the challenges of of mining those deposits, having too much water underground and needing to manage that. Um, where we are at Pengeni, there's a normal amount of water on surface. You know, you do see mines like Sentinel, for example, which is about 130 k's from us. They do manage the uh, the rainfall season, which we're in at the moment. So, you know, they do try and stockpile extra ore during the dry season so that if they do get challenges um, getting into the uh, getting the, keeping this sort of steady state production, They've got some fallback options, but with good management, shouldn't be too much of a challenge from a from a mining point of view. Mm. Um, and access of water for processing um, certainly readily available. Right. How do you? Is there? I was just reminded of something that you told me about before. Is there a difference between primary and secondary copper mineralization in this case? And and how do you how do you see that? Yeah, most of what we've drilled to date is certainly uh, primary or what we call hypergene uh, copper sulfide. So that's, uh, you know, that would be the chalcopyrite. Mm -hmm. um, we do see a little bit of uh, oxide copper from time to time, which okay. um, which can be processed. But to date, we haven't seen really more than 10% uh, in a few individual samples. So relatively minor amounts. Um, to date, uh, on the Pengeni project, we haven't seen um, significant amounts of uh, supergene copper, which is, um, you know, like you've seen historically in some of the copper porphyries in South America, for example. But, mm. you know, worldwide, that type of material is getting more and more scarce. So the copper porphyries these days generally start in hypergene chalcopyrite, um, so they don't get that kicker on the grade um, that they, they used to back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Okay. Um, what are you you're now you're drilling again uh, all the same project? What are you drilling specifically? What are you hoping the drill bit answers for you here? Yeah, so we've got a couple of questions that we're we're testing right now. Um, one of them is: Does that higher grade mineralization that we intersected does it extend further to the southwest um, under the sand cover? Does it extend um, up dip to give us some idea of the geometry of that mineralization? Um, and then to, to test the continuity of the mineralization. Once we drilled that hole uh, D22C1, that put back onto the radar for us uh, an historical hole we drilled called uh, D2C1, 
where we drilled, um, you know, 14.05 uh, uh, meters at 0.37% uh, copper. Now, can we link that mineralization to what we've drilled um, that's higher grade to the southwest? We know that these mines typically, um, if you look at uh, Lumwana and Sentinel, you know, they run in mine cutoff grades of anywhere between 0.13 to 0.16% uh, percent copper. So, you know, the cutoff grade of the material that you can mine around the higher grade zones can actually be quite low. So that's one of the things. So they're the two main things we're looking at. Can we extend the mineralization to higher grade mineralization further southwest? Does it have continuity to link it back to some of the intersections we drilled uh, in the northeast? And are there zones within the um, northwest and southeast of, mm. the, of the current intersections? How's the drilling been going so far? By the way, I believe last time you reported on news release, what it was 600 meters out of 2,000 potentially. How far are you up right now? How's that going? Yeah, since then we've uh, we finished another hole. So that, that's basically three holes finished. We're almost exactly halfway through the program right now, just over. Um, the drilling's been going well. We're drilling in a part of the year that we wouldn't classically drill, uh, but we felt the results um motivated us um you know going out in the rainy season um to follow up on those intersections so yeah field teams uh and our contractors um have been doing a great job operating safely in that part of the world um and also bringing uh bringing home the goods hopefully we'll only know when we get the results from the laboratory that will start coming in here early may um but um you know we we're pretty excited about what we're seeing um, and how that ties into what we've previously released. You say early May, but then so your 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 target was to have them all out by the end of Q two. Does that mean you're going to be releasing them hole by hole, or are you going to batch some stuff? How how do you do that? Yeah, I think we'll we'll probably put out um we'll probably put out the first hole. It's always good to get out some results of a of a new program, uh, and then we might start putting out some uh, batches of results that'll start flowing through in um you know in the rest of may and in, into june okay to your point and then after this two thousand meter is completed and then the assays are all out what are you what are you doing going back to japan i assume how what are you what are you doing there yeah so in zambia what we'll be doing is uh taking a, a very short pause there obviously take stock a little bit uh update our geological model with that new uh, new analytical data um, that will help us target and plan the um, the next phases this year of uh, exploration in uh, in Zambia. We'd like to get going with our exploration for gold in uh, in Japan again. We will just have to see what results come out of um, Zambia first, because um, you know it, it's been quite clear to us that our shortest pathway to adding real real value to um, current and potentially future investors in the company right now. Is to um, is to kind of follow up on that copper intersections in uh, in Zambia, the um, the portfolio of projects in Japan we can um, we can keep those um, uh, ticking over on a relatively low budget for now, but it's um, it's probable that we won't start drilling there until um, you know until at least another maybe six months or so. Mm. What's B 2s involvement in um, in the Japan? Pan story specifically, but also in the company as a whole. Yeah, so I mean, the reason we got involved in Japan is quite an interesting uh, relationship there. So, so B two uh, for a number of years were funding a private company that had that portfolio of um of five pro projects in Japan. Um, B two decided that um you know we they felt that we could get a bit in B metals a bit more focus and a bit more energy. Um, it was it wasn't seen as an absolute priority exploration project within the um, as you can imagine very large portfolio of uh, B two gold, so we took that uh, portfolio over, and that's what brought uh, that shareholding that you mentioned earlier the nineteen percent, that's what brought their their share share ownership into B metals, that kind of made the, the already close relationship between B metals and B two a bit more transparent to the market. Uh, and obviously, they are very good uh, financial and uh, and technical partners. So you know we work very closely um, with um, with B two Gold, uh, especially on the um, the exploration uh, in Japan. 
uh, and really were following up on targets that some of their team uh, generated um, while it was um, while they were funding a private company. Hmm. So when it comes down to financings, you expect them to keep coming in? Yeah, look, we've um, because of the market situation in the last while, we did take on uh, some debt. It's about as friendly debt that you're going to get. We, you know, it's not ideal putting debt into a into a junior exploration company, but given the um, given the situation of the market in the last uh, in the last while, we felt that was the um, the best thing to do. Um, and um, you know, as you mentioned, we we're, we've got cash in the bank now. We're certainly funded up to the end of the current drill program. Um, but we we will probably be looking to uh, raise some more money, um, you know, in the next uh, in the next months coming up here. And um, you know, I can't speak on behalf of B two, but you know, they have a decision then to um, to maybe fund their their ownership of the company as a lead order, um, or um, you know, that's their decision to make. Hmm. What is the state of the um, of the debt here? Because you have the convertible debt, and then there's also the loan portion. How does that how how does that work? Yeah, so we we took um, the the last um, the last uh, sort of convertible we took was five point three million. Um, it was a three point three initial uh, Canadian tranche um, with a with an additional two million uh, Canadian. We exercised that uh, at the very end of last year, um, and um, you know that was also partly based on the copper results coming out of Zambia. It, it made sense to exercise that extra 2 million Canadian to be able to advance and keep pushing forward on those uh, of those drill intersections. We've got that, um, we've got that convertible that um, pretty friendly terms. Uh, and as you mentioned, there's also that that loan, uh, which is just a uh, financial instrument at this point. Ultimately, there is, it's probably likely that that may be, um, you know, that may be also converted at the right time. But um, you know both of those loan agreements with B two are on uh, friendly friendly terms. You know B two wants to see us be out there drilling holes, working towards making discoveries. That's where they get their um, you know their maximum value. Right. Okay. To go back to the financing here, um, if you know you're not hoping for it, but if B two Gold were to decide not to participate in the financing. Do you still have access to capital? Like, do you have people you can call and still come up with a meaningful amount of money that you can you can have a meaningful drill program? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, through the through the wider team, you know, we've got um, access to um, some very good uh, cornerstone investors um, that have been um, been involved in B Metals for a number of years um, and have been cornerstone investors in uh, in B two Gold and and back in the day Bema Gold. So there is a there is a strong following in there, um, and if we can keep delivering on on good intersections, specifically at the moment out of the uh, the copper work in Zambia, I'm pretty confident we can we can raise um, we can raise funding for another meaningful you know set of exploration holes in uh, in Zambia. What would that mean specifically? Uh you know, set of meaningful holes, like how many meters would you like to drill? Yeah, I mean, that's that's always an open-ended question. Um, you know, I, I would say that we'll be looking to deploy next year at least a, a $2 million program. That would be another approximately 2,000 meters of core drilling. Um, that could include another 5,000 meters of shallow air core drilling. We might, might change that ratio a little bit, depending on what results come out in the next... Um, in the next uh, sort of six weeks or eight weeks here, um, and and bias that a little bit more to core drilling, but at the end of that sort of drilling, I think we would be in a good good position to really scope the uh, geological potential of that uh, of that D prospect. That mm -hmm. may not be at um, it's almost certainly wouldn't be at something that would be able to go into the market into the market in terms of a um, uh, inferred resource necessarily. But would give us internally a lot of confidence that we really onto something meaningful on that D prospect in Zambia. Hmm. So you're not necessarily doing any. I mean, you're not communicating any scoping studies internally that you're going to be doing. You're just going to drill this until you have enough to do an MRE. Yeah, the next next step will be will be scoping what is the potential of a mineral resource estimate. That's really what we're looking at doing right now. Okay, and that's something you're going to make. Well, put me. You're going to publicly announce that. Not going to keep it internally. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, if we think the results that we've got, we probably need to get another phase of drilling in before we'd be able to put out a, um, you know, a, a, an inferred mineral resource estimate. That comes down the line, but, you know, difficult to anticipate right now because we, we have to see what, what analytical results come back from the current program. So realistically, MRE by 2025, that sounds realistic. I would say the end, uh, the end of twenty four, early twenty five. Yeah, you, you hit hit sort of the nail on the head there. You know, another phase of of exploration drilling, we should be able to get something together early early next year. Okay, and then in terms of G and E, as I mentioned, about one hundred and forty a month is what it was on average over the last reported nine months. Is that what you're targeting? Sort of the same one point seven two million bucks a year G and E. Yeah, we sort of we sort of come in at somewhere around um, you know uh, sixty thousand US, so about eighty thousand a month um, in terms of uh, that GNA cost. We try and keep that obviously uh, under control as much as possible. Um, and um, you know we're a lean and mean team. Derek and I, are the only full time corporate employees, corporate secretary and uh, CFO on a on a contract basis, consulting basis. So you know. It's all about keeping that under control as much as possible um, and uh, get most of the money going out to the projects. Well, I might have done a calculation wrong or something because I came with looking at the nine months ended September 30. You can see 1.2 million in expenses. You take out the share based compensation, which is call it 144. So that's 1 million in nine months, give or take, that you spend in 2023. Um, 60 or 80 would be way less than that. Uh, why was the GNA higher over the last nine months then? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure why that would be unless unless we're including in there um, unless you're including in there some of the costs we've had out in uh, in Japan, which um, you know we don't we don't really they're really project costs because that's our team out in uh, out in Japan. So let's call it the Head office, although head office is a bit of a, a bit of a, a big word for what's actually a small, it's a very small office. You know, the the sort of corporate level, we run at about eighty thousand, uh, about eighty thousand uh, Canadian per month. Okay. Per month. I yeah. think I'm not positive. I have to take a look at the financials again, but um, we probably prepaid quite a few of the conferences in the third quarter of last year for this year. So, for example, where we met you at the SMI. Things like that uh, probably were prepaid back then, and they're pretty large, I guess, um, compared to our our, uh, our monthly burn rate. So um, conferences like that, I think a lot of them were probably prepaid back then. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks, Eric. Um, also for tuning in here. What do you? What are you doing for marketing this year? Because I assume it takes a different audience to market an African focused story than it takes to market a Japan focused story. So are you, are you changing anything in your marketing efforts this year? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we were planning to do a bunch more conferences uh, at this point, I'd say we might have to switch a little bit more to digital conf or, or digital marketing, just cause it's a little bit more cost effective than, you know, traveling around the world and, and going to conferences in Europe and so forth. I mean, personally, I'd love to focus a little bit more on European, uh, especially uh, UK-based investors, because African stories tend to be more well understood, I think, for those types of investors versus North Americans that are usually a little bit more hesitant or just not as familiar with with African assets and African uh, politic, uh, political scenes. So um, we'll probably spend a little bit more time marketing that uh, side of the world and you know, fortunately, John is based over in the UK, so it's a lot easier for him to attend some of those conferences. I don't necessarily have to, to do all those, so we can kind of keep the costs down relatively low. Right. And you're based in Vancouver then, I assume? I'm based in Vancouver. Okay, good. Good. Uh, what do you, you said the political situation, that's something I, I just realized I didn't ask about when it comes down to Zambia. What's the situation with the uh, locals and, and just political in terms of permitting? How is that process going? What else do you have to do before you can go back to drilling? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, one thing that's that's important about Zambia is there's there's a huge amount of history uh, and understanding of the, of the copper mining business specifically in Zambia. You know, some of the historical mines have been into production now, you know, coming up to 100 years. So, 
you know that that sort of uh, that sort of situation is, is bedded down. Um, permitting for for drilling per se is is done under a, what we call an environmental project brief um, that you get from the uh, Zima, which is the um, which is the Zambian Environmental Agency. Once you've got that in place, you have to stick by those um, rules and regulations, um, which would be nothing more onerous than we would want to do in any event. In fact, we would say that our um, our management of the environmental and community impact is is way better than than the sort of um, requirements uh, in terms of these uh, in, in the environmental project brief. So permitting is is not really an issue in Zambia. Um, and the good news is that there's been, you know, a number of mines even that have been permitted. We're not at that stage yet, but a number of mines like Sentinel, um, you know, expansions at um, Lamuana, for example, that have been permitted in the last decade. So, you know, there's a number of mines that have um, have got permitted. There's a real um, there's a real interest and a real understanding that if Zambia can expand further its uh, copper mining business. Uh, and the president's recently come out and said he wants to see Zambians, uh, Zambians benefit from an expansion in the copper mining business by taking that copper production from its current levels, which are between 700 and 800,000 tons per annum, up to potentially 3 million tons per annum, um, you know, which would bring it more in line with its neighbor in the DRC, um, which is producing now over 2 million tons, and it's taken it to the second biggest producer after, after Chile. Hmm. Okay, fair point. Uh, I think I've gone through almost everything. I did just open up your Senai filing just to have a peek before we close it off. And I saw that there's at the beginning of the year, there was uh, some decent insider buying. There's Roger, Thomas, Mark and Clive were all buying um, sizable portions. Uh, Clive bought a million shares. He's got quite a lot of shares too. How do you look at, and, and they were buying before that too, by the way, um, last year. But how do you, how do you look at insider buying? What's what's kind of the the maybe unwritten understanding or unwritten rule that you guys have among each other as to as as to insider buying? Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's very clear regulations uh, and and you know legal guidance on when insiders can and cannot buy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as you probably picked up there, and Derek can uh, can detail this a bit more. We crossed a large block of. Um, of shares earlier this year that came from a, a previous project um, that we were involved in. Um, they That company needed to generate some cash very quickly. So we managed to cross that block of shares, 6 million shares. Um, the insiders came in on that. Uh, we made sure all the information and all our drilling results were out ahead of that. Um, so it is quite clear that, um, you know, what those regulations are. We get good support. Clive Johnson is the biggest single shareholder um in his own right um and uh you know we really appreciate that support from from those on the board uh and other um other large groups that have um that have backed us over the years hmm. so where i'm coming from with this is obviously supporting the share price in the open market before you do a financing goes a long way when we're talking about relatively illiquid stocks so any plans to do that yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, the insiders have demonstrated, as you just mentioned, you know, a number of times that they're prepared to put uh, put 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 more cash out of their own own pockets. Uh, Derek and myself and and the others in the management team, we're all we're all fairly heavily invested in the in the company out of our own pockets. Um, so you know, we're pretty razor focused on uh, getting value uh, in the in the stock price going going forward here. Yeah. Um, and um, you know. Obviously, we just have to be careful when that happens. That um, you know, there's no there's no immediate results pending um, that uh, any of us are aware of that could um, could bias our decisions. You know, I think typically, if you look back at our trading, um, you know, a good example would probably be like during COVID when everything was crashing. There, uh, management and and the directors all stepped in and started buying up shares. So, you know, typically, I'd say that we're we're really good for supporting the stock. We're pretty low right now, and and of course the guys came in at uh, I think it was at eight cents was where the last um, the gap big cross was at when when the guys came in. So um, typically we we do try to support the stock whenever possible, and of course when, whenever it's we're not in possession of something material. Yeah, what are you guys' average cost of capital, Derek? What's your average cost of capital? 
I think for me, uh, I'm probably around seven, eight cents right now. Um, I think Clyde's probably the highest right now because he's been buying, um, in addition to the seed shares, which which a lot of people comment on, he's bought a lot more since then at much higher prices. And so his average costs are considerably higher now. Hmm. Okay. He's, I would say he's underwater and as would be a lot of the people now would be underwater actually with their shares. Okay. Is that the case for you, John? Yep, that's certainly the case. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, Clive, don't need to rub it in, but yes, he's also underwater. Yeah. You guys sleeping on the couch or something? We will, we will be soon. <laughs> hopefully not. I mean, I hope for, hopefully these things um start turning around soon. But yeah, no, this has been fun. What am I uh what am I forget forgetting to ask you though? What did you come here hoping to talk about, but I'm failing to bring up? Yeah, look, I think I think one of the important things here is is partly what you were just touched upon, you know, and Derek mentioned, you know, we're sitting here at, at um sort of eight, nine cents share price uh at the moment at about 16, 17 million uh, market cap. I doubt there are many companies um that could be on the brink of discovering a large copper deposit um, at that sort of valuation. Um, mm. You know, my background has been before I was with B Metals, I, I ran exploration in Africa for um, Antofagasta out of Chile, one of the large copper producers, now a $20 billion uh, market cap pound market cap uh, company. You know, so my background is, is, is exploring these things with the objective to build mines uh, and large scale copper mines. So, you know, we're relatively conservative in, in our marketing. We don't over promote the stock. We don't over promote our drill results. But when we say we think we're on the brink of potentially uh, a new discovery, um, you know, people should really take notice of that. Mm. So what you're saying here is essentially world class tier one district scale underexplored elephant country. Yeah, I mean, that's that's yeah, kind of why we picked up. I mean, it was a project that I generated in my days with um, with Antofagasta for all those reasons that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and along with all these sort of fundamentals on copper, you know, the thing that gets overlooked the most, we know we're not finding enough copper. The grade of what we find is generally getting lower. But what's the real issue is that just aren't that many good quality exploration projects out there for for companies to really follow up on. Great. Well, thank you, John, for uh, the overview. Hopefully you can keep me up to date with the development over there. Zambia is an interesting place, uh, so I'll be following along for the rest of the year. Uh, but in the meantime, I do feel like talking royalties, and I'm talking to Patty Nickel, who, despite the similarities in his last name, does not run a nickel company. He runs a royalty company, an organic royalty generator, actually, by the name of Origin Royalties. Companies listed on a TSX Ventures Exchange and the ticker symbol OGN, where an average of about 130,000 shares trade each day with a 52-week high of 92 cents and a 52-week low of about 50 cents. With a market cap of about $165 million and about 193 million shares outstanding, today this is an 86-cent stock, so not too far off from that 52-week um, uh, uh, high. There are 7.2 million warrants and 8 million options, which together with the RSUs and the DSUs bring the number of fully diluted shares to just about 210 million. Insiders here own about 4% of the company. Sprott Asset Management owns 9%, 9.8% uh, 9 actually, so it's almost 10%. Global Strategic, that'd be Adrian Day's group, owns almost 11%. Then there's Altius Minerals, owns 15.2%. An interesting thing that should be discussed later on in the conversation and all other institutions own about 10%, leaving less than half of the company in the hands of retail investors. As of the last uh, SEDAR filed financial statement, which is dated September 30, the company had about $18 million in current assets, about 7.1 of which in actual cash. That was supplemented by about $5.8 million in short-term investments, $2.8 million in marketable securities, and $2.1 million in receivables, as well as a small portion of prepaid expenses. The short-term account payables of about $500,000 are what made up the majority of the current liabilities, and there is no long-term debt outside of a, a small lease liability. That same statement tells me that running this company costs, on average, uh, over that last reported three months, about $200,000 per month being spent on stuff like travel, marketing, conference management fees, and so on and so forth. 
And this is where I typically give you the GNA to exploration ratio, but I'm not doing that, not going to do that here because there is no drilling. This is um, a royalty company. It being a royalty company, it also means that it's a revenue generating business, but not doesn't always mean that actually, but in this case, it does mean that it's a revenue generating business. Uh, not something we're used to around here. Um, and according to the unaudited preliminary 2023 numbers that they recently announced, they generated $8 million in revenue, which resulted in net income of about one point eight million dollars as always though please head over to the company's website read the official filings and the news releases go to setterplus.ca if you feel like being annoyed by the website to look at the most up-to-date numbers and its official news releases because this is um well numbers change of course as always fun accounting stuff to decide though this is not a typical royalty generator the name itself um actually uh, well gives it away a little bit because origin stands for organic royalty generation there are basically three pillars to this business. The obvious one is buying royalties. It's not something Origin does a whole lot of, and it's very strategic when they do it. Again, something I hope to discuss more later on. Um, then there is the prospect generation pillar. That's the that's sort of the main way of doing business here, if you will, where a, a geological idea um, it, it gets put together uh, and either optioned out to someone who'd want to drill it or it gets sold again to someone who wants to take the project further. In that process is where the organic royalty um, generation comes in play because when doing such deals on the prospect generation side of the business, Origin then typically retains a royalty on those projects. And that's how, um, it, well, given that the prospect generator model actually has been working well over the recent past, this results or has resulted uh, at least recently in a zero cost acquisition of the royalties within within this pillar specifically. I am not going to walk you through uh, all of the royalties here because there are a handful across uh, many different jurisdictions across Canada, Mexico, the U.S., uh, Latin America, and even Africa. But there really is one flagship asset doing the majority of the revenue here for the time being, and that's the Ermitaneo mine. This is a producing mine down in, uh, as the name might have already given it away, Mexico, Sonora, Mexico specifically. It's owned and operated by First Majestic Silver. And Origin owns a 2% royalty on this asset, which, by the way, last year produced 100,000 ounces of gold and 1.2 million ounces of silver. And um, this royalty specifically generated $5.9 million in revenue last year, whereas $1.8 million was generated by the prospect or generation pillar, just to give you an idea. The other asset, which you could also call a flagship asset right now for Origin, or really the, the company maker that is expected to become the company maker over the next couple of years, is the uh, Greater Silicon Project. That's a gold project, not yet in production, but expected to be in production by 2026. Project is operated by Anglo Gold Shanty, and it's located in Nevada in the U.S., and uh, Origin owns a 1% royalty on uh, the, the uh, well, a, a portion of the two deposits that make up that Greater Silicon Project. Uh, the total resource of that um, silicon project is uh, 13.3 million ounces of gold. And this is oxide gold. <clears throat> Excuse me again. I'm not going to walk you through the entire portfolio here. This seems like a good time for me to start shutting up. So uh, instead of continuing talking, Patty, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off with a, with a question here, um, sure. specifically around what's happening in Nevada, because that seems like this is going to be sort of the company builder. Um, I know Anglo Gold is not as as liberal with the information here, uh, and as the market might like, or as you might like them to be. So, what's uh, what's the latest there? So, yeah, I think the the I think the key thing is to to walk us back to sort of the the original time when when Origins uh, Exploration Team, the Renaissance Team in Nevada, actually acquired this ground. This was a an early stage prospect, had very little drilling on it. Um, this was back in two thousand and fourteen, and so our crew uh, viewed it as an opportunistic uh, situation to go acquire a bunch of ground. Mm -hmm. um, that ground was subsequently optioned to Anglo Deshanti, who you've identified as the operator there. And so since then, they've they've gone on and drilled specifically within our royalty AOI, about 300 kilometers of drilling, so 300,000 meters, a tremendous amount of um, drilling has taken place. And during that time frame between sort of 2017 and now, they've they've done that drilling. They've gone out and acquired the lands around uh, the, the key deposits in question. So Silicon and Merlin, where we have our royalty AOI, they picked up Corvus Gold. They paid $450 million for them. They picked up the lands to the south from core mining for $150 million. So the $600 million investment gives you a, a sort of a sense of, of the scale of what Anglo Gold is trying to achieve here. And you're right, the, the, the key 
portion of this whole camp. They call it the Greater BD District, and within our royalty AOI is called the Expanded Silicon Project. We have a 1% NSR over um, 13.3 million ounces of gold. And that those were uh, covered by two deposits, silicon, which is 4.2 million ounces. And then the Merlin deposit, which was announced a little over a month and a half ago, which is just over nine or just on 9.1 million ounces. So as I mentioned, 13.3 million ounces. And as you identified, this is oxide gold resources. So um, this is the, the lowest cost form of, of mining you, you can have. And so that lends itself well to uh, heap leach operation. And that is uh, something that we're looking forward to. So the uh, greater district itself starts in 2026. The royalties, uh, the area that we have the royalty on will probably kickstart sometime in 2029. And so we expect to see the royalty revenue coming in. And so we, we've we been, obviously, the, the, the first uh, couple years of, of the exploration of the project was uh, pretty scant on information. I think Angle Gold was trying to figure out exactly what they had. They were trying to put the land packages together so you can understand maybe why there, some of the information wasn't so forthcoming in the early days. But now that they've got the land consolidated, they've relocated their uh, uh, headquarters from South Africa into the United States. They're in Denver. The New York Stock Exchange is now their primary listing. So they are now actually being very forthwith uh, with information. If you go through some of the uh, public information that Angle Gold has released, uh, you can really get a sense of, of, of what they're trying to do here. So it's been it's been quite an impressive run. Um, as I mentioned, the, the 9 million ounces was announced uh, at the end of February uh, to add to the existing 4.2. So it's really had a sort of a a transformative move for for origin and for the company. So it's it's been it's been very exciting. And then I think you know this stuff beyond that that it's a little bit harder to for investors to to see at this stage. But as I mentioned, it's oxide resources. There's a, a sulfide component that they're not talking about. There are um, beater structures that we don't know about yet, which could add a significant ounces. And both deposits remain open. So we see this as a tremendous opportunity for the resources that exist today to grow well beyond what they are. Hmm. So for you, basically, the royalty, as you said, kicks in in, in 2029. What's the expectation mm -hmm. um, for revenue then? How much uh, How much gold are we talking about here? Right. So it, it'll it'll be it'll come down to a function of production um, in the early days. Angle talked about 300,000 ounces of year a year production. They've now upgraded that to 500,000 ounces. We think that there could be even greater in the future. But if you take sort of a 500,000 ounce uh, annual production profile, Origin gets 1% of that. And so you can sort of pick your gold price as to what it is. And that's the beauty of being a royalty holder. We have no capital contributions or anything like that to, to the production of the mine. We just take 1% uh, of whatever gets produced. So you could see a, a, a revenue profile that exceeds 10 million US per year. Um, for that that royalty. The royalty is non-viable, it's uncapped, um, and it covers a, a nice, you know, it, it covers the, those two de ore deposits. So that's, that's I think, really key to this. So, the, so that makes this very attractive, very exciting uh, for, for us. Right. So yeah, again, as you said, 500,000 ounces, 1%, 5,000 ounces, you put a $2,000 gold price on it if you want to be conservative, sure. and mm -hmm. you get into 10 million revenue, basically. Um, yeah, ex exactly. And and that's multi-decades. That's not, you know, for five, 10 years. That's that's a long way out there. So we see this as a very long-lived royalty asset. Right. Okay. Uh, you said the royalty is non-buyable. Mm -hmm. There's currently something going on between Altius, something we can talk about later on as well, but something is going on between Altius is 1.5% royalty uh, yeah. on that same land pack. Well, not a same land pack. It's actually double the size of land package, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that they yes, have a royalty they, on. Yes, they, they have a larger royalty than us. It's 1.5 versus our 1%. Their royalty, rev, their royalty, um, pardon me, their agreement is substantially different than ours. We have a fixed area of interest, so we know exactly where our royalty sits. Um, the uh, royalty agreement that Altius has has an expanding AOI nature to it. And um, so if you read their agreement, uh, it, it lends itself to the entire camp. So it would capture North Bullfrog, 
Um, it would capture all the lands um, to the south of the expanded silicon project, which is sort of the Sterling motherlode um, areas as well. And so that's that's what's sort of in question right now. And, and we don't have anything to do with the arbitration process. Um, and we have two completely separate independent royalty agreements, but that that we expect that to resolve itself sometime midway through this year. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, and you're probably not the right person specifically to interview about that. I should probably try and get someone from Altius, but it's just interesting looking at what do I know, right? But looking at that agreement, it doesn't look like there should be an arbitration. But I know also on Anglo Gold side, I kind of get why they're involving themselves in it. Like there's not much downside, right? No, I think, I think, you know, when I first started into the royalty business, I had a lot of people tell me that royalty agreements are nobody really cares about them until there's something found. And when there's something found, there's always, you know, nuances to to different agreements and, and, and what could happen. And so I guess naturally Anglo gold is, is wanting to resist this expansion, expansive nature of, of the royalty agreement. And I guess given the, the size of the camp, um, it's something that they obviously um, are, are probably going to fight, but, but, you know, I've, I've read Anglo's agreement um, it's a well, very well written agreement. So we'll have, just have to see how it goes in arbitration. Do you think we see more arbitration as the metal prices are going up, though? As in, like if this is if gold goes to four thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and and I'm not trying to be a you know you know a psychotic gold bug or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So so taking four thousand um, mm -hmm. dollars, twenty million dollar worth of royalty, that's a lot of money for anybody uh, in mm -hmm. any type of scenario right so would you are we going to see more arbitration between royalty companies and producers i think it can happen um especially when the the economic stakes become very very high in these projects um or or projects that were once marginal now become economic and, and things like royalties may start to pull away from those economics and so you're going you're going to see you could see um the the mining companies pushing back a little bit, but look, I think, you know, if you have a, a well-constructed, well-written royalty agreement, I think it becomes very difficult because there are, there is a, a component to all this where you know, if you get through these arbitration processes or court processes or however it goes, um, there is also the, the award of court costs and damages and things like that. So I think sometimes groups should, you know, perhaps think twice before they, you know, they, they start to challenge uh, certain royalty agreements and look i you know the the altius guys uh for as long as i know them, they they do meticulous housekeeping and they always have very strong very well worded royalty agreements so you know i i always have for, for groups like them i i you know i i always i i would think that that they they clearly know what they're doing so i i i would be less um sort of apt to contest things like that. But there are royalty agreements out there that that probably can be challenged elsewhere. Hmm. Hopefully not within your book. And that's what I'm asking here, basically. Like, are, are you are you trying to manage that risk already? Like, are you doing something where you're reviewing the agreements yeah. or having lawyers look at them? Well, we, we have a template that we like to work off of. And, and um, we've tried to take the best of bits and pieces of agreements um, from from what we've seen over over the last several years. And we we always apply those at the first instance when we construct a royalty agreement. Um, I would say that that when you're working with juniors, uh, they're less sensitive to some of the language and royalty agreements because that really doesn't concern them so much because they're the type of group that will develop a deposit. They will take it forward as far as they can and then a major comes in. And so they typically feel that it's the major's responsibility. So why why should they care? so strongly about it. The majors, on on the other hand, if you do a deal with them on a when we're doing a, a joint venture or an option agreement or a purchase and sale agreement to sell the project, um, they are more sensitive. And so the the language or the the edits that you will see in those agreements tend to be tend to be a lot more substantive than than what you would see with a junior. Hmm. Okay. Tell me more about that involvement by the way of Altius in this story. Um, that's always kind of been interesting. That's the, or the thing they're buying share. They were buying shares in the open market, sort of increasing their ownership. Are they still doing that, or is it still buying? Uh, well, they, they, yes, they. I guess to 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 talk about that at the instance, um, they have approximately fifteen percent of the company now. I think fifteen point two percent, 
they hold all the warrants in origin as well. And so those warrants come due at the end of this month. Um, those warrants are exercisable at 40 cents and those warrants will take them to approximately 19.5%. So they're, they're kind of tapped out by what they can buy. If they're going to stay under a 20% ownership, um, which is important, um, they, they've, they've kind of limited out. So how they got their shares is you're correct. A lot of it was through the open market. Um, over the past few years, they've, they've purchased shares. They also held shares in the company through private placements, the predecessor companies that formed origin. That's where they had their positions as well. And then the, the royalty that they got on Silicon is because of an alliance that a group called Callanan royalties had an, an alliance with Renaissance gold back, I believe it was in 2012 and the funding that Callanan gave Renaissance to generate projects, one of them happened to be Silicon. And that's where the 1.5% royalty came in that transaction. And that's how Callanan got it. Altius bought Callanan about two or three years later. And that's how Altius ended up with that royalty. But they also ended up with shares in both companies through through private placement. So they they acquired their their ownership in, in origin and bits and pieces over time. Hmm. What's this relationship um, currently built on? What does that look like? Is it is it more mostly sort of um, you know, personal trust or personal friendships? Is it are are they trying to do a takeover here? What's happening? So I, I think a lot of the the relationship stems from the earlier days of of prospect generation, and and we obviously continue that to this day. Altius uh, also. You know, they're a royalty company, but they also do prospect generation as well. And I think we have this sort of mutual um, respect for the business model. And they are active in, in Canada, largely from a prospect generation perspective. We're active in Canada, but also in Nevada and, and down into Mexico. And so I think the the obviously they, they watch what we do. And uh, I believe they like what they do to the extent that we've got an alliance together working in Nevada, in the Walker Lane to develop more silicon type assets. And so Altius provides a lot of that early stage funding. We're providing the data, we're providing the people and some of the business development expertise that we have with respect to selling projects to groups in Nevada. And so we've been putting this together now. We're just moving into year three with them. We've generated five projects together. Um, we sold our first one uh, last year called the Cuprite Project to a group called Strike Point Gold. We're now drilling Cuprite as we speak. And so um, that's the type of arrangement. So obviously they, we see the world from a structural perspective with, with business models very, very similarly. And they just, they, they like what we do and uh, they're, they're good guys to work with. So, and, and look, they, they have a, a royalty on silicon and, and you know they see the 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 same thing we do with respect to the 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 future potential of it and they'd love nothing more than to have another one in their portfolio as would we so that's that's why we do the things that we do together it's interesting though to me specifically that ownership i mean i, I appreciate the background and the history of the of that royalty there that one and a half percent but they're they they don't they don't typically get involved in the gold royalty business right so wouldn't it make sense for them to maybe sell you that royalty for shares given their desire to to own your shares like how will that work they they could um you know we we obviously uh can see a pathway to do that i think the challenge is is that both altius and origin we're always looking for the best transaction we possibly can for our shareholders and you know if we can get a, a great uh price on that royalty which you know, I don't think we can compete if if there's other royalty companies out there trying to buy that royalty asset. I I don't think we would be able to compete. The other side of it too is that if you did sell your shares to Altius, they would own end up owning somewhere between sixty to seventy percent of our company, and and that's just sort of a ballpark number. I'm not putting any sort of value on on silicon, but but that's just sort of my 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 thought. Your income. Uh, would all report up to silicon or would report all up to Altius. And so it it doesn't, it we wouldn't really be a, an independently run company. We'd end up being a sort of a subsidiary of Altius in the end. Right. And that's not necessarily where you want to take this strategically. Is that what you're saying? Or No, I think that there's, you know, two real pathways here is one, you know, can you grow origin uh, beyond what it is today? And certainly we see opportunity 
Um, we've held off on using shares to buy assets today because we simply can't find anything that's good enough on a comparable basis to silicon. So we've held back and their share price historically hasn't been there up until till recently. Um, and then obviously the other way, the other angle is to is to monetize um, silicon as it is. And look, we're not putting a for sale sign out in the company. Um, but if uh, a bid comes in from a royalty company and that's entirely possible, um, and if that bid is a right bid, then we're going to have to consider that because that's, you know, we're here for shareholders first and foremost, and, and trying to maximize the value of this as, as, as we best as we possibly can. And so, you know, there, there's obviously nuances to, to both of those scenarios. Um, and, you know, it's something that we're cognizant of and we're, and we're tracking, but at this stage, it's, it remains to be seen. And I think a lot of that's going to be dependent on the uh, what Altius is doing too, because if they're selling theirs, then you know there, there's a, there's other implications to that. So we we um, are you know doing the the early stage prospect generation. We're always got our eyes on royalty assets as well to purchase. Um, as you were mentioned earlier, we we don't have any debt and we have a substantial treasury now. I think. As of sort of this past month, we we're closing in on the sort of the twenty to twenty one million dollar mark for cash, which includes, you know, your short term investments and securities and things like that. So we we have uh, a treasury that we can actually go out and buy royalty assets if we want to start to grow this in in a meaningful manner. And so that's something that that you know we 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 do uh, really focus on. But again, if uh, a bid comes in that's so good that's something we're going to have to take seriously and consider it what would that look like though because you said the right bid the right price a couple of times what is that 200 500 what is it yeah i, I mean i have to be careful by what i say um because we we don't have you know those numbers that, that aren't they're not public um and we have our own sort of internal analysis but I, you know if you I think that the best way to, to probably frame this is that if you looked at sort of the spectrum of gold royalty companies out there, I think there's like a sort of pure gold royalty companies. There's probably a dozen, maybe, maybe 14. Um, collectively, those royalty companies, and that's from groups as, you know, like Origin all the way up to the Franco Nevadas of the world. And, and they hold collectively 2,100 royalties. Um, of those 2,100 royalties that are held, there's 16 out there that are like silicon. That's it. And of those 16, they're all held by groups like Franco, Royal, Wheaton, maybe a Cisco, maybe a Triple Flag, but that's it. There's everything beyond that. So when you look at a, an asset like, like silicon and you see where the, the net asset value of these larger royalties trade at, you can understand that that's the, the price point or that's the the, the the multiple to net asset value that these companies could be willing to pay for a royalty like silicon. So when you see royalties trade, if you look at it over sort of a 10 to 15 year period, they sell for anywhere between sort of 0.9 to maybe 1.1 times net asset value for a standard royalty. When you look at royalties like silicon, they trade somewhere or sell, transact between 1.5 to 1.8. And that's where we see the value coming in from from Merlin and Silicon. And look, we're not there yet. And so that's why we, you know, we are uh, particularly sensitive to what's going on, obviously, with with the Silicon Merlin project. And that's why we're uh, we're very firm on where we think future value can be driven in the company. And and that's why this is, you know, that's why it's sort of this decision point is so important to us because we can grow the company. We know we can do that. But you know, can we grow it in the time frame that it would meet sort of a, a fancy bid if it came in? That's something we have to figure out. And that's kind of where we're at right now. I do want to talk about that strategically mm -hmm. and how we grow it and all these things. Uh, mm -hmm. But something, that, that thing that you mentioned, 1.5 or 1.8 times the value. Um, that's interesting because that's exactly where I was thinking around. I was maybe even thinking around the magnitude of two, specifically because of the optionality. And you talked to me about that, about what Anglo is telling you. When I say optionality, is it looking like like those two ore bodies will join into one eventually? Basically, they they have said publicly that the that the two zones are contiguous. Uh, 
they didn't say continuous. I don't know exactly what they mean when they say contiguous. Does it join up at depth? Join up at depth? Is there a weaker mineralized zone between the two? Is it strong? I don't know. I mean, we don't. We have really no idea what it is right now. And I think the the challenge with with Anglo is that they have drilled so much uh, in the past year. They I think they drilled one hundred and thirty thousand meters at Merlin alone in uh, or yeah, one hundred twenty nine thousand meters last year, and most of that was at Merlin. They've been trying to play sort of catch up, if you will, with Merlin to try to get it to the same stage that it's the silicon targets at. And so, you know, so they're 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 trying to understand exactly what they've got. As I mentioned earlier, the zones are open. Merlin's open to the west. Uh, silicon's open to the southeast, I believe, uh, and at depth. And so there's still lots of this unknown. So, yeah, so. The zones could be contiguous. The zones are still open. The sulfide material hasn't been talked about. We'd love to understand what the feeder structures look like, but again, none of this is public. So we don't have data rights to understand what they're doing right now. So we have to live through their public disclosure. But when you think about all these things, and, and look, we have a very experienced team. You look at other deposit models uh, within Nevada and you can start to paint a picture um, of a size potential that, that uh, you know, could well exceed what the 13 million ounce resource is today. That's the optionality I was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I was hoping they, they were telling you more about that than telling me basically. Uh, but well, it it's, yeah, it's, we, we don't, we don't get it. It's, it's, uh, we, we, uh, but I, like I said earlier, we, we, we're getting more and more information now. They're much more in the for the, the front foot trying to, um, tell the market what they've got. They did an analyst tour, um, every quarter now it's, all talk about silicon and that was the main feature of the year-end financial presentation that was all about merlin specifically do you usually go to these analyst tours or send some of your guys or like how does that work yeah i i've been down once uh the gsn uh had a tour uh, about a year and a half ago um and so we got a first look at at the sort of the scale of of silicon uh and at the time they didn't have anything out on merlin but you could see that there was I think I counted eight rigs that were drilling um, or, you know, on, on the ground. So, so you get a sense of, of what they're trying to achieve. And I, you know, you can, there's a public road that goes right through the property. So you can, anybody can drive through there and have a look. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive um, by the scale of, of their operations. Um, and so, you know, they had an analyst tour last fall. We didn't get to go on that tour, but look, we we have a good relationship with them. We've been talking to them, um, and uh, I don't see why they wouldn't let us back on the project again. It's you know, as as an you know, any sort of interested analyst, we're we're also interested in the development of the project, and and they're getting public level information just like we are. So it's you know, should be all good. Mm. Okay. Fair point. Well, that helps me sort of wrap my head around what's going on there. Um, what about Ermitanio? It's um, closer yeah. to the end of its life than it is to, its, to the beginning of its life. Maybe. Um, look, I, I think, well, actually, I would say no. We, we They've had three years of production. Um, they have focused, obviously, it's been on the proven and probable resources that they established. Um back from the 2021 prefeasibility, I would say that the, that the the way that the prefeasibility was described and what the production scenario has gone are complete, two completely different things. Um, they have, uh, obviously the, the production rate is higher, the grades are higher. Um, they are doing a lot of both in mine and around the mine drilling, trying to uh, establish new resources. In fact, when the mine went into production, there was a new zone discovered called Luna. Um, and that is just to the east of the main Ermitano splay in the central Ermitano core. Um, and that is, that's what our view is, it's going to add additional ounces. Our royalty AOI is 170 square kilometers. So it's, it's very substantial, substantial. And uh, there's been a, a I say outside of Ermitano, there's been virtually, I won't say no drilling, but very little drilling that's gone on exploratory drilling on the project. And we know that there's targets. When we had the project, we had identified, I think, another six, if not seven targets within the project that need follow-up work. So, you know, so Irma Tanyo, it's it's great. Uh, we still see at least seven years of mine life out of it. 
um, beyond uh, where we're at today. And so it's it's going to carry us through it. I, I'll say this. We've been on the mine site. Uh, we did a, an audit already. And the team down there is fantastic. They're doing great work. First Majestic has put in uh, a substantial amount of uh, infrastructure build out. They put in uh, a dual circuit. They put in a high intensity grinding mill. They put in a filter press to improve recoveries. They uh, invested into an LNG plant. So they got away from diesel power or, or generators into um, uh, an LNG plant to provide cheaper power. So these aren't insignificant investments. They are investing for the future. And they've got a nice land package beyond even Hermitania. They've got the existing Santa Elena ground and they've got some ground to the north as well. And so they're, they're targeting uh, a number of areas. This year, they've got 59,000 meters of near mine drilling, trying to find additional resources to add to what they've got already. Um, they came out with a reserve and resource update, uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago. You can see where they've taken some of the inferred resources and added it into the MNI resource section and proven improbable. So actually, the 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 the, the MNI resource level has not changed much, which is nice to see. So there's been a, a significant conversion, a, a good positive conversion of inferred resources into ore, and so we're we're very happy about that. And and like I said, the the zone at Ermitanio, especially towards the east, is still open. Um, and as they've said in their presentation, the, the, the future for for Ermitanio lies in Luna and also another zone called Soledad, which is to the southwest um, of Ermitanio, but both sit on our royalty AOI. So that royalty gave you, what, six million bucks last year. Do yeah. you, you, how is that going to be different by the time you get the, the money from Nevada, basically? Um, so I think... We'll continue on. I think you know if you look at this year, the guidance for twenty twenty four is is similar. I think they're targeting uh, ninety thousand ounces um, and of gold and one point two million ounces of silver. Um, obviously, gold prices are different. So whatever I think we we lose, perhaps we might lose a little bit in terms of gold production. I think the silver production is going to stay the same, but the gold price is up. And so you for so whatever we might have. Loss announces what we, we might gain back in, in the gold price. So we don't exactly know uh, where the revenue will sit for the, for next year, but the production profile, if again, if we go back to the PFS, was supposed to start to drop after this year, but we don't see that happening. The Santa Elena mine um, has been more, I won't say it's been exhausted, but they don't have enough economic resources to get out of that mine anymore, that mine anymore. So they're focused solely on Ermitano now. And so that's why the importance of, of the near mine drilling and adding additional resources. So if you get towards possibly sort of 2029 type of thing, you know, it, there's a lot of unknowns um, at this stage. But from what we see today, things look pretty robust, at, at least for the next few years. Whoop, pardon me, my computer just moved on me. Your technology is getting tired of listening to my voice and my silly <laughs> questions. But so it seems it almost seems like Jared Canyon is working in your favor right now. Um, so uh, or, yeah, the lack thereof. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah they, they've had their challenges in, in uh, Nevada with with respect to the uh, production. I mean, they've had production, but I just the, the cost of recovery sounds like it's very, very high. So that that hasn't worked out for them. Yeah. At least today. They're still trying to fix things. So, you know, we'll see what happens for the future. Yeah, that's true. Do, do you expect them to have any uh, challenges in, in given the political situation in Mexico? A lot of, um, yeah, a lot of noise, if you will. Yeah, I mean, the Mexican mining reforms have been challenging. Uh, I think if you're in production, as they are, and you have title to land, and you've got your permits, I don't think there's any issue there. Um, I think the biggest challenge if you're in Mexico today is for actually prospect generators like us not being able to get title to land. And, and so we've got a number of projects that we have acquired. Um, we can't market them because we don't have title to them. We, we love the projects. We think they're fantastic. Um, but until things change, um, for us, it's, it's, it's kind of tools down. We've got Nevada, which is you know on firing in all cylinders for us. Uh, we've got British Columbia, which is doing great for us. Um, we're looking at other jurisdictions outside of Nevada and in in other parts of Canada too. So, the nice thing about being a prospect generator is that we do have that nimbleness. You can jump into a variety of 
jurisdictions, but we love Mexico. And historically, we put millions of dollars into that country, into that, into the project and exploration down there. And now it's been turned off by, by, by the government. And so it's, it's become a real challenge for us. So we do have some existing projects that we do have title for, um, and we're looking for partners down there. And we obviously have the royalty that we have to administer down there. So we're, we're not leaving Mexico. We're not going to abandon it. But the the exploration effort that we once had down there is nowhere near what it, uh, what that today is nowhere near what it used to be. Hmm. Hey, you bring up an interesting point that you're looking at, at other countries. What kind of deposit types are you looking for? What do you like working with? So our, our the historic... Um, experience for us from a I guess a, an exploration perspective has always been gold and copper I mean we western British what you know British Columbia as a whole whether you're in the south central part or northwest British Columbia it's always been sort of uh copper gold rich porphyries um or gold projects as a whole uh and then into um western United States obviously depending where you are Nevada has been a primary thing primary uh, area for gold exploration, but we've also been in the past in Arizona for for copper. Um, we have, and then in Mexico, Northwest Mexico, it's always been gold copper or gold projects. And so the the thing that has always been, I think, a real benefit to us, and this is something that I always think is a bit understated, is that we're exceptionally data rich. We've got tremendous databases, whether we generated them on our own, whether we purchased them. Or acquired them from a through a transaction that we've got a fantastic data set and you know coupled that to a, a group that's really data driven to generate projects and so that's been one of the hallmarks and so the of of what we do and why we do it and I think that our exploration partners appreciate the fact that a lot of the projects we bring to market are brand new projects they're not recycled projects. Um, there's always good stories, new stories, uh, good exploration angles. And so that's been one of the things I think, or one of the reasons why we have the number of joint ventures that, that, that we do or sort of option agreements that we do today. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question about jumping into other jurisdictions, we have data in other areas that we're not really active in. And uh, we obviously like to go generate projects. When we do, especially nowadays, we like to bring in a partner on an alliance level. Um, and so the the next transactions we hope to have, uh, at least for 2024, not only for you know option projects or sold projects, is also for alliance level type transactions. And those are typically with bigger companies. We have one today with with Altius, which is a unique one because they're a royalty company. Um, but we historically partnered with big producers, so Valet, Newmont. Um, ArcelorMittal, we did iron ore for a while as well. Um, and now we're, we're trying to maybe spread our wings a bit and look at some zinc exploration as well um, to augment what we've got with respect to copper and gold. That's a very interesting point. And, and I, about the zinc, and I like how you put it when you said data rich, because when I typically lose money in the stock market, I tell my wife, oh, at least I learned something, but I'm going to switch that to saying now I'm data rich. I'm getting I'm getting richer in data. It's <laughs> a very good point. Um, what about what, what, when you go to when you start looking at a different jurisdiction, that's not BC, something that's well familiar to you. What, yeah. Are you looking for geological endowment or are you paying more close attention to the political situation? Both, I would say. I mean, first and foremost, you got to have the geology, right? That's that's key. But but the other nuances are obviously the geopolitical scene, permitting, mineral tenure, um, that sort of safety. I mean, safety is always huge, no matter where we go. So we we always have to make sure that our teams are are safe. Um, but the other factors are always important too. And so if 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 it comes down that even though there might be a, a real interesting geological idea to to go into a jurisdiction if it's not safe or if you know you're not certain that that the geopolitical side is is going to work out then then we don't go um and and that's not so much been in western north america it's been other parts of the world we've had other opportunities to whether it's different parts of south america or it's different parts of um you know there's we looked at africa other uh, parts of Europe, there, if there's a, a a quirk, and especially you know we we don't we're pretty small, we're we're not big enough to kind of 
go in there on our own and, and start trying to generate projects, which is why we like to take alliance partners with us because they help with the funding of generating those projects. So for us to sort of take a, a, a jump into say Eastern Europe, where we don't have, so we might have data, but we don't have a ton of experience. It becomes a very difficult place for us to, 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 to be effective. Mm. Yeah, that's a fair point for, from 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 the geological standpoint. What about the political yeah. situations? That can you give me examples of places that you wouldn't go? Um, and and you're not gonna get you're not gonna get away with the easy stuff like the Sahel Belt. I get that part, but something else that you don't like. Um, look, I, I would say that you know some of the so there's some countries in in South America, um, that that we would just given the uncertainty of the the sort of the political regimes that uh, or a permitting situation where you know it's going to be really difficult to do um you know for or or even i would say uh east africa um we've seen some great projects there both from a royalty perspective uh and and you know project generation perspective but that it's too difficult for us to to get involved in there hmm. um too too risky um, we just we wouldn't we wouldn't do it. And even, you know, Eastern Europe in some parts, like some groups, like they really have a, a solid understanding and they've got a solid connection to government and groups to be able to to effectively explore there. We don't have that. And and so even though, again, geology is is great, um, you can see the opportunity. But if we don't have the team that can actually go and uh, you know, coordinate, liaise with with various local groups. Then it's just it's where we wouldn't we wouldn't do well. I don't think. Well, you, you, good point. You don't have the team to, for example, go go in Eastern Europe. That's a good example because I'm thinking of a company, and we don't necessarily have to name any names, but there's a company that you can literally go and buy using your cash that only does the Tethian the Tethian belt, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting geologically, they seem to have experience in it. You have the money. Wouldn't it make sense for you to do M&A and, and buy someone like that? Possibly, yes. Yeah, there there, there are those conversations, um, not, you know, with specifically to that region, but there's others around that, that we've met up with over the years. Again, it, it comes down to, I think, socializing some of these, these transactions. Um, not everybody's, you know, willing to, kind of walk away from what they've been spending a ton of time on. Um, and you, you know, you, you also have to take on the cost. I mean, we, we have a, we operate our prospect generation business profitably, which is a bit of a unique thing. Um, there's probably maybe one or two other companies that that do it like we do and they operate profitably too. And so we have to make sure that whatever we're trying to do, um, we can generate a profit because when we, we, Put origin together. One of the key things that we were sensitive to was the fact that people look at, at the prospect generation side. And I, we didn't want origin to be seen as taking our hard earned royalty money and putting it back into high risk exploration. So we created, we set the team up and structured it in a way that that it has to operate profitably, and we've done that now for on three years. And so we'd have to ensure that that. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we can we can replicate that, and that's not always easy to do. Um, so that's that would be another consideration. But you are right. I mean, there there are good teams out there. There's good people um, that that you could pick up. But again, it's it's there's always it's not always as as what you see at face value that you can do those things too. We we've you know, even before Origin, when the predecessor companies were operating. Um, with the Evram Group, there was a number of those opportunities, and they just, for a variety of reasons, they 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 don't always work out. But I can see your your point. There is a, I think, an argument out there to have a, a collection of these prospect generators put together and form one super <laughs> prospect generator company. It's it'd be pretty yes. cool. Yes, and with a GNA that's potentially half of what if you put four of these companies together, your guys's total GNA, uh, you can. Uh, Anyways, there's an argument to be made about potentially yep. having less GNA in the sector and being a more, a more efficient sector. Um, That's right. What's how do you, how do you balance um, being able to carry yourself in your own GNA forward versus doing strategic deals? Like, would you ever be like, okay, 
let's this is our entire treasury 21 million bucks there's an there's a deal that we can do and we spend all of that money or do you always want to keep a certain runway in treasury I think you want to keep it right away. Um, you know, if you found the ultimate, ultimate deal that you knew 100% was going to work, well, maybe you do that. But, but I think it would be a risk to deploy all your capital into one asset. Um, and then because, you know, we, you see these situations where a mine's about to go to production or it's in production and something out of left field comes and either the mine shuts down it's a political issue or it's a health, it's a safety thing. And then, you know, you're stuck. And, you know, so that's why we're, we're sensitive to raise to, to taking on debt because a lot of assets that get purchased um, have that risk. And if you don't get into production in the time frame that you've got, you're suddenly servicing a bunch of debt and you may not have the financial resources to service that debt. And that's what one of the one things that we were really sensitive to when we started Origin. We did not want to do that. And so to this day, we we haven't done it. Hmm. Hmm. That's that's I and I appreciate that approach. Um how, how do you how do you deal with marketing in the meantime? Because you and I met at a conference in, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Um and, and I'm just thinking if you if you don't necessarily need to go back to the market right now or you don't have to go for debt. How does your marketing strategy change versus what it would be if you had to go back to the market? Well, look, I, I think right now Silicon has been doing most of our marketing for us. And so that, that's been a wonderful thing. Um, you know, we, we our, our GNA cost for investor relations is actually very low. Um, we, we tend to focus more on, on, you know, trying to, you know, have be profitable, but, but I get your point. Um, look, if, if we found an asset and th again, this comes back to the rarity of, of, or the specialness of, of Silicon and the difficulty of finding a good asset. If we found an asset that, that we really liked, um, yeah, you, would you raise money for it? Possibly. Um, that's one of the things I think that, but, but it's going to be on a very special occasion. We don't need money for GNA. The last time Origin actually raised money or the predecessor company raised money was 2018. So it's been seven years plus now since we we actually raised money. So if we were to go out and do it, it would have to be something pretty special. But we could. I mean, that is that is one of the options that's out there. And I would think that there's enough demand right now in the market. It's one of the, I would say, frustrations from uh, an institutional investor standpoint is they can't simply get enough shares of Origin. And so consequently, they aren't, they aren't investors or they're not shareholders. Um, a lot of them have asked for private placements. We've resisted that because we, we, again, we don't need the money. But again, if we found, if we found something that we really, really liked, well, then we would, we would have to cons consider that. Mm. That's my goal to get to a point where I, I just, uh, there's not enough shares for me to buy. I have too much money. Um, <laughs> what is, uh, you have nine active joint ventures out here. What's yeah. the um, all of them active this year? A lot of news flow, or how do you how do you see that? Um, not all of them. Um, but you know, I could probably pinpoint, uh, probably five that are that are, I would say, going concerns, if you will. Like they're they're exciting. Um, probably one that's that's been generating a lot of news over the past year. The the project in question is is the Spring Peak project. Um, is held by Headwater Gold. They've been making a tremendous amount of news over the past year. They have a partner with Newcrest, who are actually is now Newmont. Um, they just announced a, a 7,000 meter program for this year. So that's going to keep them very busy. They've made a discovery at Spring Peak in, in the area called the Disco Zone. And I think the, the strategy right now is to expand beyond what they've discovered and, and you know add more ounces. There's no resources yet. Um, still early days, but we really like the story that the, the they're involved in. Um, another one that, that's sort of active right now is, is I mentioned this earlier, is Strike Point Gold. Um, they have the Cuprite project that we sold through the uh, Altius Origin joint venture. Um, they are uh, drilling 5,000 meters. Um, they're in the middle of it, so I have no idea exactly how things are going, but they're they're in the middle of it, so that's, that's great. Um, Nevada Gold Mines, which is a, a Barrick Newmont joint venture. Um, we have the Maggie Creek project, which sits right beside their gold quarry mine. Um, they're looking for 
I guess, near mine ounces to add to the existing operations. Um, they'll be drilling in H2 of this year. Uh, so that's an exciting one. And, you know, those are coupled with some pretty beefy cash payments too. So like six, $700,000 cash payments. So those are, that's, that's a nice, actually it's 750 this year. So that'll be a nice uh, cash payment if it comes in. Uh, smaller groups like Ivy Minerals, they're private. Um, they'll be drilling uh, the Ghost Ranch project. Uh, probably sometime late this spring. Um, so like right there, there's there, those are four sort of active uh, drilling projects that are going on. And um, we see, oh, I would say upwards of, at least in Nevada, of, of outside of Silicon is probably 15,000 meters plus of drilling for, for at least in, that we see today. Um, and then if you move up into British Columbia, uh, the Kingfisher guys, um, they have a joint venture on or an option agreement with us, pardon me, on uh, the Ball Creek, or they called Highway 37 now. Um, mm -hmm. And so they, they plan to explore that later this year. Um, we have a royalty on what's called the Hank Project, which is also part of that Highway 37 project. So we, we hope that they'll be putting some holes into that. And then um, Kodiak Copper, uh, who South Central BC, they have a, 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 a copper gold porphyry target from their gate zone in the MPD project. We hold a 2% NSR on the MPD South, and they made some uh, really interesting gains there last year. There's still actually uh, drill holes that are pending on the project from the drilling last year, but they'll start up, we hope, with a, a good sized program. It seems to be one of the key features of their exploration strategy. So, so there's, you know, there's another one and, and, you know, these all kind of can be the next leg in the stool, if you will, from a valuation perspective and any of the projects can, once that discovery is made and they're onto it, like it can become the next big value creator for us. And that's why we like sort of the volume of, of joint ventures or, or option agreements that we, we have out there because it, it keeps teams, you know, it, it keeps information going um, and it, and it, creates that opportunity for for you know that leverage for value creation which is a key part of our model right that's a a good overview there um i'm not hearing much about kenya um i'm oh, interested well, in <laughs> we can yeah we can talk about all those i mean that's look larica in in the kenyan the larica in colombia is mm. probably one of my favorite royalties in the whole, whole portfolio i mean this is a project that was actually dis, you know, it's it's not a discovery, but the project was identified in in the late '60s by the United Nations and the Columbian Geological Survey. It has sat undrilled for 50 plus years. It has a 15 kilometer long trend of copper anomalism outcropping its surface. Again, never had a drill hole in it. Obviously, the political climate in Colombia historically has not been good. They had FARC. Um, and they had, uh, you know, a variety of governments that, that and, and a lot of NGO interference. Um, and so, you know, it's changed now. And there's uh, a private group that, that holds the, the claims. And I can't get into too much detail about what, what, who they are and what they're doing. But what I can say is that the, the political climate's much better. Um, FARC is gone and, and they're going through a peace a settlement process. And so there is a, a an engagement process with local community um, to get the buy-in. They're looking for permits. Our hope is that they're drilling, whether it's late this year, or early next, but I love that target. I think that 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 type of royalty has the leverage to be at least like silicon. Hmm. And so that to me is, that's why we do those types of deals because it has that, that growth potential. Hmm. Um, in Kenya, uh, Shanta Gold is the operator of the, uh, They've got a number of uh, mines and deposits throughout Tanzania in, in Kenya. They have uh, what's called the Isulu and Bushingala deposits in Western Kenya. It's a greenstone belt. We are claim the claims that we have royalties on surround them on the east and west side. So the, the greenstone belt trends into both sides. We also have them on the north side on what's called the Rosterman area. So 3% royalties. Um, in time, we expect that they'll move out on those projects and, and drill them. Um, there's been some historic great soils. Um, you can see it that there's opportunities. So, uh, you know, it, that's a little bit further down the road. I don't know if it has that 
leverage to be, you know, a, a silicon size type asset, but it it has the size potential to be a very nice asset for us and, you know, put it along the same scale, sort of scale as our Metanio or something like that, which nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Okay. It's a good overview. We can probably keep going uh, if we have to uh, pull apart all of them uh, over here, but you told me you have to go and I've already not been too respectful for your time. Yeah, no worries. Thank you though, Patty. For sitting down with me, I really appreciate the overview. What am I forgetting to ask you? What did you come here hoping to talk about, but I'm failing to bring up? No, I look. I think we covered everything. I think obviously the 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 key with with the, the big value drivers in origin. It's obviously it's 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 an expanded silicon project. It's the the information that's going to come out over the next while. Like that's one of the key catalysts. Angle goals talking about it quarterly, so we're getting a lot of good information now, and it, it sort of helps. I think frame. Uh, what's to come in, in the future there so we you know keep our eyes out on that um we've obviously got this optionality coming in from all the different option agreements that we've got the news flow is going to be strong um and so like i said any one of those options can be the next big discovery um as to what we've got uh irma Tanyo provides us tremendous amount of stability uh and so the downside risk i think is really low um, the upside opportunity is huge, and and that's sort of how we've tried to build Origin. And uh, it's again a different business model. Not all royalty companies do. We do. It's it's this is not an easy one to do. You have to have a bit of patience. But when that when it flips over to discovery, that's when the true value creation event comes, and that's why we do what we do. Very good. Well, well, thank you, Patty, for um the overview. I've always liked the idea of the royalty model. So uh, w with this being somewhat of a unique uh, thing, I'll be following along and hopefully I'll get an update from you on what's happening there soon. But in the meantime, I'm actually not going to wander off too far away from where you have a lot of your revenue coming from. And I'm going to be staying in Mexico to talk to a gold and silver producer uh, slash developer, with that being Go Gold Resources. Companies listed on a TSX main board under the ticket symbol GGD were an average of about 740,000 shares straight each day with a 52-week high of $2.29 and a 52-week low of $0.94. Cents. With a market cap of, let's call it $500 million and about 330 million shares outstanding, the stock is currently on the rise, sitting at $1.54. There are no warrants, uh, but there are some options, and options together with DSUs make up a total of about 15 million units. That's one, five. Insiders own about 20% of the company here, and institutional shareholders here includes Prod Asset Management, as well as some other names that are probably on your screen right now, most of which you're going to recognize. As of the last Setter filed financial statement, which is dated December 31, the company had about $108 million in current assets, about 89 of which in actual cash supplemented by $14.8 million in inventories, $3.2 million in trade receivables, $1.2 million, $1 million uh, of recoverable from taxes, and there's also some prepaid expenses. Current liabilities here, about $13.5 million, mostly in income taxes and account payables with no long-term debt, notably. That same statement tells me that running this company costs, on average, uh, over the last reported three months, about seven hundred eighty thousand dollars per month in GNA. And in that same period, the company spent about one point four million dollars on studies, exploration, and geological consulting, in total, regarding its two main assets that I'll tell you more about here in a second, resulting in an exploration to GNA ratio of about zero point six, or in percentages, that means that GNA represented about sixty two percent of the total spend between those two. Again, as I said, this is a producing company, though, so there is revenue, $6.8 million over the last reported quarter, and that costed $5.8 million to generate. So not profitable if you add the GNA, but otherwise operationally profitable if we don't account for GNA. As always, please do head over to the company's website as well as setterplus.ca to look at the most up-to-date um, numbers, financial data, stuff like that, official news releases, because numbers change and things will be different by the time you're watching or listening to this. Accounting is indeed one of the most fun subjects, uh, but sadly, I'm going to have to leave it at that because there are also projects to talk about here. In a nutshell, GoGoat operates the Peral tailings facility in the state of uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, and then it also has the Los Ricos South and the Los Ricos North exploration projects in the state of Jalisco, also Mexico. Production overview of the last five years is probably on your screen right now, but in 2022, Peral... Um, 
and, and don't by the way don't let the name fool you it, it, it didn't produce um only gold it produced 1.8 million ounces of silver equivalent now Peral is a uh, unique situation because production actually comes from above ground here so they don't actually have to go and dig it go gold basically goes into the city the, that that city is also called Peral. Not a small city, but about between 130 to 150 thousand people in it, and uh, they then so go gold goes in there, takes the tailings. They they export the tailings that are left behind um, various previous operators to a heap leach side, just outside of the city. About 10 kilometers of trucking is what they do, and then they leach gold, silver, and copper. Uh, but as of recently, there's also a zinc circuit here, um, and and all of that combined is what makes the money basically. Uh, hopefully we get an update on that later on. But this also is, is expected to keep making the money for at least another five years. But um, again, more on that later on, because that's actually not the main pitch here. The main pitch, the flagship asset, if you will, here is uh, Los Ricos. It's technically two projects and uh, the south and the north part of it carry the name. So Los Ricos South and Los Ricos North. Los Ricos, as the name suggests, is, again, as I said, also in Mexico. It's about 100 kilometers away from Guadalajara, and the two properties are, um, they are, by the way, about 25 kilometers away from each other, uh, and they cover about 22,000 hectares of land. Both sides of the property are at the PEA stage, although they are being advanced separately, and the updated PEA on the more advanced project, that'd be the self project, shows a $458 million in um, NPV, and that's NPV5, and that's at $21 silver and $1,550 gold. Initial capex, four hundred eight. Uh, no, excuse me, $148 million, and uh, an expected annual production of 8 million ounces expected to be produced at an average cost of about $9 per ounce of silver, um, not including g and financial costs and stuff like that, of course. And that's going to be over a period of um, 11 years in total. So that's the LOM, resulting in an after-tax IRR of 37%. The PEA on the North project was done at slightly higher metals prices, specifically $23 and $1,800 silver and gold, respectively, resulting in $413 million of MPV. This is also, again, MPV 5. 13-year life of mine here, though. Uh, average production cost a bit higher, but still sub $10, $9.68 to be specific. And a bit higher annual prediction too, that'd be 8.8 .8 million equivalent ounces of silver per year is expected to come out the ground here. After an initial capex that is also a little bit higher, that would be $221 million. And that results in a slightly lower, though definitely not low, um, IRR of 29%. Uh, different mining scenario here though, about 75% of production is expected to come from an open pit containing oxide mineralization. And then 25% is expected to come from a separate open pit, which contains only sulfide mineralization. Whereas with the South project, half of the production is expected to occur from a traditional open pit. And then the, the other half will come from um, employing the long hole stoping uh, method, which is an underground extraction method for um, minerals. The South portion is expected to be in um, operation first, followed behind by the North part about three or four years after first production there. And with that, I feel like now might be a good time for me to start uh, thinking about shutting up and start asking some questions. First of which, Brad, and thank you for being here, of course. But let's maybe kick it off with a brief update on um, timing. You were initially targeting to to get the underground permits for the south part of the Los Ricos project uh, mid this year. Things are changing in Mexico. That's about two months away from today. How's that looking for you? Yeah, it's looking uh, well in and start off thank you for that uh, recap of the company very uh, concise um so there is an election obviously in june 2nd in mexico for a, a president and um the ruling party morena is um projected to win that election right now in the polls um the uh two candidates are both uh uh two women uh soshi garvez and claudia shambaum and uh, Claudia Shambaum is, is leading the race right now. So um, the issue with permitting in Mexico, and I've been here 27 years, I mean, permitting has compared to the rest of the world has been relatively easy in Mexico. It's been a technical process, but, you know, typically move quite quickly. Um, we have, <clears throat> we filed for a permit last April and uh, we're down to the final stages of that uh, technical evaluation. And we also applied for an underground permit only, which is important because the most of the um, noise coming out of Mexico has been around open pit permits. Um, really, they're not saying that they're not going to grant underground permits. That's not in the uh, 
you know, not in any of their talking points, but it's more the current president, Lopez Obrador, doesn't care much about mining and has said that they don't want to open pit permits. To actually have that happen, they'd have to change constitution and he doesn't have a super majority, uh, so he cannot push that through. So um, back to your question, we're thinking um, that it will still be mid-year for the underground permit. And um, we're thinking that uh, mid-year to, to kind of the end of the summer is what we're hoping for, um, which kind of coincides with our definitive feasibility study being completed as well. And we'll be ready to break ground. Uh, so yeah, still mid-year to the end of the summer is, is what we're, we're thinking how it's going to go. Hmm. And um, a lot is depends on the outcome of the election. I mean, by some chance, if Sochi Garvez won the election, then she is very, very pro-mining. And uh, Claudia Shambaum um, is, we feel, although she would still be in the camp of the left, and um, that we, but she would be more business friendly. And that's generally the view down here, and that she would, uh, it would be better for mining than uh, the current president. Hmm. But you don't, the fact that, that this is an election year, you don't expect that's going to slow down the permitting process in, in any shape or form. Well, we've been at it uh, by midsummer, it'll be over a year. And um, there is, you know, sometimes in Mexico, when there's a change of government and they're, you know, with the change of government, they change the top level, which is a secretary or, you know, in the Canadian system or European system, probably a minister. Um, and uh, then they'll change the director and subdirector. Um, so there is sometimes a, um, a push before those. Uh, positions uh, change to um, to you know close files, and uh, we've seen that before. Uh, you know, all this time down here in Mexico, twenty seven years. So, and they will change those roles September first. So we see that there potentially could be a window, um, you know, between the election and September first, where they want to uh, clear the files that you know are kind of at the top of their list, as you know, no no issues as far as uh, issuing. And with that last step of the technical process complete, really our file, we have the community behind it. It's an ajito, kind of communally owned land. We have an agreement with them to build a mine. And they are um, so much behind the project. They're actually sending letters to the uh, government saying, hey, please help us uh, advance this permit so we can get uh, started here. That's something I do want to talk about um, when we move forward. Um, both the both the, the 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 tech stuff behind it, but also just the community around it. How different is this process, though, that you're going through right now? Given that it's an underground permit, sort of a fifty fifty underground to open pit, you're only doing the underground portion right now. How would that differ versus if this was just a hundred percent open pit off the gate? Yeah, right now in Mexico, they've really stalled and kind of. There's no law against open pit right now, mm -hmm. and there probably will not be because they won't have the super majority to do that. Um, but that being said, I think e even in the new government, open pit permits are going to be more difficult. Now, we look at the Los Ricos deposit, fortunately. Um, it can all be mined underground and... Uh, you know, we have to finish the studies. Now, in our evaluation in the definitive study, really what we're doing is we're taking that underground ore body, which we start with the underground mining, and we're going to plant it right to the surface. Call it the vein, but I mean, it's a very broad vein. It's an average width of 11 meters wide. Mine that right to surface. And we do what's called cement, a cemented backfill with the old tailings. So we would uh, mine it to surface even to remove the crown pillar and um, we'd have a cemented plug right to surface. Now, that's a little bit different than the PEA. In the PEA, we had a nine to one strip ratio open pit and an expansion of our mill from uh, 1,750 tons a day to 4,000 tons a day. And that expansion would happen in year three. Now in the uh, definitive study, what we're planning is to mine right to surface. And then in about year 10, have a much, much smaller open pit on the surface to take out the halo that was still remaining around that um, 
uh, vein, which we would have taken out, that cemented plug that would go right to surface. So that would really push the need for an open pit permit a decade into the future. Mm -hmm. and, so and, it becomes much less of an issue. Right. And it's also essentially you're mining out a, a mountain, as it were, like a, a, there's a hill, basically, uh, once yep. you get up to surface, right? Uh, yeah, it kind of runs up the side of um, almost a cliff, the yeah. uh, underground structure. And right. um, and in fact, on the surface, you can actually see that vein going up the side of the cliff, mm. uh, paralleling it. So um, and then, you you know, you'd ask, well, what about Les Ricos North? Today, that's all planned as open pit. And um, the thing about Les Ricos North, it's it's really the same geology. Um, it's the same big regional uh, structure that runs for tens of kilometers. And um, in the north, we originally planned it as an open pit, all of it, because we knew that would give a, the highest NPV. But um, really, we know that uh, in an open pit, you know, to run an open pit for early stage PEA, not only would give a better NPV, it's, it's much easier to plan. Uh, you know, you put it in what's called a widow program, a widow um, pit program or Lurch Grossman, and it just gives you the pit quite easy to do. Now, uh, planning an underground mine is sort of way more involved. So our plan for Los Ricos North, you know, right now we're very much um, buried in a definitive feasibility study for Los Ricos South. We're in the process of getting our debt financing facility in place and our permit. So that's where our attention is today. Now, once we're building Los Ricos South, we will put aside some money for advancing that study in the North. And, and probably replanting a big, big portion of it as underground. You know, we'll wait and see what the political situation is in the fall. You know, it may, it may have uh, got a little more friendly towards open pits, but that's an option. I guess what I'm saying is here in Los Ricos, we have the option because these deposits can be mined open pit or they can be mined bulk underground. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I suppose it helps having high grade in that case, of course. What um what I'm thinking about, where I'm coming from with this, because I'm thinking, um, at, at what if, right? Sure, nobody's hoping for it, but humor me. What if permitting for the open pit part in ten years from now proves to be more challenging, or even for the for the north part? That's where I'm sort of coming from with this. Yeah. And and I think that warrants questioning because of of what's been happening in Panama. And this maybe is within the yeah. broader topic of is Mexico headed? I mean, is it leading more towards Panama type of government, or is it leaning more towards getting permitting processes that look a lot like what we have um, or, or what you guys have in Canada? Yeah, I would say it's more heading towards what we have in Canada. In fact, I would say uh, a Claudia Shambaum is more towards what we have in, in Canada for government today. You know, sure. yes, left leaning, uh, WEF, you know, World Economic Forum kind of. Um, government but uh, uh green transition uh you know she has a phd uh she's a scientist so that's 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 what we're gonna have now so panama panama didn't have much of a mining history uh mexico has 450 years of mining and uh you know it's an important part of their economy um I, I think that she knows that she'll need these metals for a green transition, especially silver, copper. And, uh, you know, the fact that in the um, trade agreement with Canada and the U.S. and Mexico, if you read some of her Q&As, uh, you know, she said that she recognizes that foreign investment into Mexico is very, very important. And um, she's saying that she will support and she wants to support business in Mexico and foreigners investing in Mexico. So, you know, is it going to be perfect? Um, no, it's it's going to be more like Canada, where probably permits are going to take longer. And, um, you know, that's, that's fine. I mean, we operate at that standard anyway. But um, it's not going to be like Panama. I mean, they're not going to try to nationalize the mining industry in Mexico. I would, I don't see that at all. So, you know, this, this agreement with Canada and the U S is, is so important to Mexico. I mean, I've been here 27 years, so I've been here most of the time that NAFTA existed. And then in 27 years, the change in Mexico has been incredible. You know, the middle class has grown. Um, 
you know, when 27 years ago, it was all old cars on the road. Now it's, um, you know, it's new cars. People are doing much, much better. And it's all because of that agreement with uh, Canada and the U.S. So I, I don't think, I think she's uh, very intelligent. And I don't think she's going to want to rock the boat too much there. What would that look like, though? Uh, again, just sort of humor me, quantifiably, what would it look like if the permitting process shows more difficult? I don't. Looking at what you have underground, I don't see it being a, a game over type of scenario, but definitely a change um, if the permitting process becomes more, I mean, tougher. Yeah, like, I mean, I don't want to, I, I, I want to make it very clear we have to complete studies before, you know, the, you know, the, I don't want to just throw things out there um, because they're, they're proven you know, with a lot of detailed engineering. But in general terms, I think you're looking at, it's all underground, never open pit, maybe um, 10 to 15% reduction in NPV. Okay. So it's it, this is very much an underground mineable deposit. Hmm. That's, um, yes, thank you for quantifying it like that. That's exactly what I was looking for. How is, um, if, if we were sort of to move away, maybe from the permitting process, how's, how's, cartel activity sort of the first thing that maybe as someone who's not in the know i've never been to mexico so i don't exactly know how things happen in the ground if you had any encounters anything worth talking about at all so in 27 years in mexico we have never been extorted um you know we have never had any issues with cartels and yes they're everywhere in mexico and uh some some states are much worse than others where we are in jalisco it's it's very there's no issues. I mean, we've been there now for five years, never an issue at all. Mm -hmm. um, here in Chihuahua, the same. So, and, you know, maybe part of that is because, you know, we are, I, I think we are somewhat um, important to the government down here. We brought a lot of economic benefit to the, you know, to the communities we work in. And, um, you know, over the last 27 years, it would be in the billions that we've spent down here. So, um, you know, I think sometimes you might think, you know, there's the cartels would say some things are maybe a little off off uh, limits. You know, I mean, they do value them. Well, you know, current situations, some people might uh, disagree, but I do think um, except for the rhetoric right now, all the if you take the total time of down here, I would say they very much value their the mining industry. So. You know, so I think, uh, yeah, it's never been an issue. How many people do you employ down there in Mexico? Uh, 350. Okay. That's a, what, what percentage of that is local? Uh, okay. So there's five of us in the company who are not Mexicans. That, oh, that's it. That's it. The rest of it is all local. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why I'm asking this because I was just obviously maybe already thinking too far ahead, but maybe also not. Uh, but thinking about labor, you know, oftentimes I, I, I talk to a lot of like industry experts and, and, and CEOs and so on and so forth. First risk that people bring up is skilled labor. So for you, when do you start making hires? Where do they come from? And will it be challenging to find good people to, to mine uh, Los Ricos? So in, in Los Ricos, our plan for the mining part is all contractor mining. And uh, we've gone out for RFPs, uh, requests for pricing, um, as part of the uh, process here in the definitive study. And, um, you know, we have a short list of contractors who are able to do the job and they have the staffing to do the job. And um, I think where we would hire more would be um, kind of our mine planning, uh, geology, you know, mine geology survey and uh, really monitoring the contract because we have a very, very detailed um, contract even in the bidding process here and the pricing process, very, very detailed. And I think we'd have a, a team of 10 or 12 people there who would basically, you know, we, we give the short-term mine plan. So you go into a stove and this is the way we do it. We say, okay, uh, the contractor, because this is always the dilemma. And I, I mean, I've been mostly involved in underground mining in my career. And it's always the dilemma. Do you have development is typically done by a contractor, but in stoke mining, um, it's either going to be contractor or you build up your own mining team. Now, in this case, because it's bulk mining, we would give the contractor basically the layout for the blast holes in the mining stoke 
And uh, we say, okay, you're going to drill these many holes, this position, and you're going to load them with this much explosives and blast them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what we'll do with our team is just make sure they do that. And with the very well-defined contract, make sure that, you know, uh, every unit of uh, work is, is defined and, uh, you know, we monitor um, and, and verify and audit the invoices to make sure, you know, the uh, units of work, you know, whether it's bolting or, or trucking or blasting was all done as per contract. So that's the way we're approaching it. So as far as ramping up, we won't have to ramp up as much as if we were building up our own mining team. It, it, is it more expensive though? I assume it's a little bit more expensive to work with contractors than it would be if you had gone and, and sort of built your own team. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, um, but we're taking the approach that yes, you know, you have to pay their, their profit margin on it and we'll, we'll structure a contract where they're bonus or, you know, delivering at the performance levels they're supposed to. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, you give up a little bit of profit there, but you know it, it allows us to go from a small producer right now to uh, kind of approaching an intermediate producer. We think with less bumps in the road, so we think it's worth the profit margin we'll pay them. Well, that's a very good point when you say bumps in the road, because I was also about to ask you about sourcing materials, machineries, and stuff that you might have already or not placed orders on. Um, mm -hmm. but is that something they're going to be helpful with? I mean, is that, do they help you mitigate the risk of, of material shortages? Yeah. Um, you know, they'll come in and they'll start off with some of their, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Some of the things that are longer lead time items right now would be who, who would think underground mine fans are, you know, that's a, a longer lead time item, but, um, we'll start off with the contractor or they'll bring in their own fans. And then as we get deeper into the mine, you know, then we'll have hours and we'll install those. Uh, things like that. Um, mills. Mills are can be a longer lead time item, but we're going to be looking to the used market and do a total rebuild of the used mill, which is pretty typical, you know. And uh, so I would say, you know, long lead time items, certainly our attention is um, on that right now. We haven't ordered anything yet, but um, we're just kind of getting closer to finalizing the design of the mill. And um, as we get, you know, the sizing of components, and because we have such a, a strong cash position, uh, you know, we can do some ordering. And, uh, you know, probably by the summer, we'll start ordering some long lead time items. Okay. When and if you get that permit um, by mid-year this year, let's call it June, July, August, somewhere in that range, when do you start breaking ground? Is it is it immediate? Do you have to get a bunch of duck, ducks in a row? But before that, how does that work? Yeah. So again, with our cash position, like we can start doing things right away. I mean, we can start surface work. We can um, start um, advancing uh, ramps. And those are another thing that, you know, they take time, especially you start off a ramp, you're only working on one heading. So, you know, you can only basically get nine meters a day. So that's something that takes time. So um, we'll start right away advancing that, you know, get the, uh, get the contractor mobilized and uh, advancing the ramp. And so, then from then on, what sort of your target, if everything goes sort of spotlessly, how long before your, your, your shipping concentrate? Yeah, so 18 months of um, construction is the estimate. <clears throat> and um, after that, I'd say, well, we won't be shipping concentrate <clears throat> because this is, um, <clears throat> pardon me, we um, produce a Dore product. So okay. uh, it'll yeah. be a Dory product. Yeah. But um, really uh, first pour, you know, 18, 20 months and, uh, you know, reaching commercial production where it would be about uh, two years from the start of construction yeah. you know, to reach commercial production. Yeah. And, and you're doing where this is a mill, you, you know, you reach commercial production faster, um, you know, as long as we have uh, all the stopes um, in sequence, you know, and we're supplying the tonnage every day. You know, the mill, is obviously, it's, it ramps up pretty quickly. It's right. more pushing hard on the mining part of it to make sure that we have the available stokes to feed us the tonnage we need to feed that mill. That'd be more the ramp up in the uh, reaching commercial production. So you're, you're producing dory bars. Um, 
but so, so off the off the bat, you're not gonna have any other circuits for anything else, zinc, lead, anything else that you can recover. So in Los Ricos South, um, we'll have a, a SART plant at the barren end of the mill. And um, really that's to regenerate cyanide. There's a little bit of copper in uh, part of the deposit. And uh, so to lower the, the uh, processing cost. But um, in actual fact, um, we could operate the mine without a SART. Now we operate SART technology at Corral. We've been operating there with SART for four years. Very, very familiar with it. It's uh, about the same size SART plant as we built at Corral. So, um, so there would be a little bit of uh, copper stream coming off the, um, as a byproduct of that SART plant to regenerate cyanide. And in fact, um, you know, we have um, about seven term sheets in front of us now for the debt portion. And one of them is actually somebody proposing to buy that copper stream. So, you know, in, in uh, meetings with, you know, our, our shareholders, sometimes, I mean, it's not buying, there's no binding agreement or anything. It's just a proposal. I, you know, bounce that off people. And uh, what, what would you think of that? And most people just say, well, we don't even think of you as a, as a copper producer. So if you can get $25, $30 million for a copper stream, um, why not take it? <laughs> that sounds like a good amount of money to me. Uh, yeah. But essentially, Dory bars by 2026. Sorry, say again? D Dory bars by 2026. That's what Correct. we're talking here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. How are things going in the data room, by the way? You said you have seven parties. Are you shortlisting potential dead parties or, or anything that you can tell me more about? Yeah, we're, we're evaluating those right now. And um, it, it's going well. I mean, with uh, the amount of equity that we have, um, you know, and the project being a high margin project, uh, there's a lot of people interested. So it, it'll be a bit of a competitive process, you know. So we have all those term sheets in front of us now and we'll, you know, evaluate a couple of things, obviously cost of capital is uh, paramount. And um, the other though is flexibility. Um, flexibility in that, hey, we want to keep on advancing Las Ricos North while we're constructing Las Ricos South. I mean, advancing it in engineering, maybe go up there and do some more drilling and tighten up the drilling. Um, so, because our you know bigger picture, our bigger plan here over the next five years is that we get both mines into production or, or close to getting both mines into production because then you're talking a company that's producing as much silver equivalent as a, a Hecla mm -hmm. who's trading in around $4 billion market cap today. Yeah. So, so that's a nice thing about gold gold. We have that pipeline um, all right in the Los Ricos district. So by 2030, then, because because the north this the north deposit is is about four years behind uh, the south one, so right. we call it yeah. 2030. You're a hecla sized producer. That's your initial goal here. Yeah, that, that's right. Well, our initial goal, of course, is Las Rico South, and and uh, but to keep on advancing Las Rico North, so we can stay on you know with that pipeline to get there, right. and um, and you know we wouldn't have as many reserves as a hecla, but we would you know be around the same production. And, and we'd have an all-in sustaining cost of uh, right around $10. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. sub $10, as I mentioned at the beginning, was a 968 yeah. is the higher one on the north part. And then and 906. Yeah. 906 yeah. on the, yeah. Good. What kind of, um, I want to talk about uh, what's happening in between those two projects here in a second as well. But what kind of, uh, just before we do that, um, what kind of interest rates are you typically looking at here realistically? Because you mentioned cost of capital. Yeah, I mean, it's that uh, is all being driven by mostly by our CFO, and he's been, you know he's bringing me up to speed on it. But I would say they would range from uh, nine to twelve percent, you know, with um, current kind of uh, so far um, up to about uh, you know fifteen to fifteen eighteen percent. You know, mm -hmm. some of the some of them are fairly high interest rates, but you know we have some more Main Street banks who are looking at it as well. Yeah. Well, 15%, again, that's not, a, that's not a cheap loan. And where I'm coming from with this is because g given where the silver price has gone recently, but that's where it seems to be headed, which is to say, hopefully much higher. Um, and your share price is also up over 50% off its bottom early, like two months ago, I believe it was sub $1, $1 per share. 
At what point in the share price do you start considering equity as a viable option to finance this build out or, or is the answer just never you want to do all that? Well, you know, really, it's a two-year payback. So um, I think it's it's well suited for for debt. And if we can get debt, you know, at twelve percent, I think it's debt's the way to go. Um, and we did our last finance financing only a little over a year ago, two twenty five. So I know we've gone up quite a bit recently, but we hope to be back over that kind of two twenty five over the next six to twelve months. You know, so that's where we hope to be. Um, and I think, uh, there's a lot of value in that permit. Now, uh, you know, are we going to get a permit? I feel very, very confident in saying, I don't see that we're not going to get an underground permit. So, uh, open pit is, is more difficult as we know, but I think, uh, you know, it's, you know, maybe a little bit here, we're uh, throwing out the baby with bathwater. I mean, we're asking for an underground permit. We're going to get an underground permit. So, um, you know, that's, that's not a question, but when we get that permit, then all the perceived risk is out of it, or a lot of the perceived risk. I mean, I know there's still execution risk, but, you know, we have a definitive study and this is not the first time we've done this. This will be mine number five. So, um, not in Gold Bowl, but in, in my career in, in Mexico. So, uh, that permit is, is, uh, you know, we're trading around a 0.3 now. And developers right now who aren't kind of suffering that discount for Mexico are probably trading around a point five or point six. So really with the permit, we think there's potential to double just by having the permit right here. Hmm. You know, even before construction. Does and I assume the answer would be yes, but does financing the north portion become way easier once the south portion is in production and cash flowing? Oh oh yeah, for sure. I mean we pay down the debt. We build up the equity portion of, uh, you know, the facility for the North. And obviously, you know, if you're, if you have a producing mind producing this kind of cash flow, I mean, the lenders are, you know, it'll be more the main street banks who are going to do it. I would think. Yeah. Just what I'm thinking about, um, uh, initial CapEx to build Los Ricos South, um, in total, $148 million. As I said, yeah. Needed in stages, though, not all at once. Um, what else is there to be done? Like, why not sell Corral, for example, and finance it that way without the need to go into debt or anything other strategically or, or creatively that can happen within the company? Yeah, no, that that's uh, right. Uh, Corral only has, though, um, around five years left, a little less than five years. Um, Corral is going to, uh, although... The last couple of quarters probably didn't look so good, but uh, it's coming up as you know, we released our uh, production numbers yesterday. And um, that's it's coming up with the uh, SART circuit being uh, online now, the zinc circuit. That generates a lot more cyanide. And the operation is really always a balance between enough cyanide to get the kinetics in the heat, to get the recoveries of the gold and silver, and not so much cyanide that you kill the economics. That's the real balance at Peral. So I, I think we're on a real good track there. I think by the summer we'll be uh, looks like our plan is that we'll be making 800 to a, a million dollars of free cash flow a month. So mm -hmm. it's going to actually be a fairly good contributor again, you right. know, through the uh, build, build of Los Rico South. So I don't know, you know, with that uh, short of a mine life left, if, you know, if, if we could sell it, there had been a, a bit of interest a couple of years ago in Peral, you know, um, especially from some more green funds, you know, green, green money, let's say, you know, uh, but, um, you know, not, nothing ever got closed. So uh, I, I see the opportunity to reap some, some benefit out of, out of Peral over these next five years. Right. So okay. there'll be money coming in. So that, well, that still is going to help. Um We'll carry g &A and other stuff like that in here. Again, I, I do intend on touching upon uh, potential exploration here. Just before we do that, because we're still sort of on the topic of um, eventual production, uh, understanding, of course, that the, the, there are quite a lot of forward-looking statements involved in this. But talk to me mm -hmm. a little bit about maybe the challenges here. You mentioned the strip ratio. Talk to me also about grade and thickness variability, dilution, recoverability. What are your what, what do you see as the main challenges and how do you take them on? 
So in Las Ripas South, let's start with the dilution. Um, in the study, we used 28% dilution for our uh, longitudinal sublevel uh, long hole mining, um, which when you consider the average width of the vein is 11 meters wide, that's a pretty healthy conservative dilution number. Um, as far as the, you know, what are really the, you know, main risk factors I always look at when I look at a project, I'm going to look at um, things like metallurgy and the metallurgy is very good. Uh, we've done a lot of work in definitive study on, on metallurgy. Um, of course, resource, you know, how tightly is it drilled? It's drilled very tightly. If you look at our resource statement, there's very little inferred and um, a lot of measured. So that's um, positive. Um, you know, on, on mining, um, you know, like I said, we're trying to mitigate that risk as much as possible by using, you know, a contractor and, and building up our monitoring uh, team and taking that approach so that the transition from, yes, as you said, uh, not even open pit mining we're doing right now, we're really doing processing, you know, at Peral. But, uh, and I, I think the other way you mitigate the risk is like, like I mentioned, this is not the first time uh, I've done, a, been involved in a lot of underground mining and um, uh, members of our team have as well. Um, there's underground mining is, is, you know, there's lots of expertise in Mexico and underground mining. So, um, you know, that's, it's all mining. I'm not trying to say mining's easy, but it helps if you have experience, you know, it helps if, if this is not your first one, you know, so, uh, you realize after, you know, the first mine I built was uh, 20 years ago and, um, you realize that, uh, maybe then you didn't know what you didn't know, but now we know a lot more of what we know. Well, that's that that that's one way to put it. That's something I I, I think about every day. What about uh, what, what, are you doing any anything else this year? Any met work or anything maybe perceived as boring but important nonetheless, like trying to up recoverabilities or something else? For sure, yeah, yeah. We're doing all the um, the mill is being uh, designed by Osenko Osenko, and uh, they built the uh, Silvercrest mill uh, over in Sonora that mine, and um, also Lakefield is the uh, metallurgical. Um, consultant so we're in right in the thick of that now and it's all around optimization you know optimizing um seeing if we can squeeze a little more recovery out and but we're also trying to keep as simple of a circuit as we can you know we don't want to be you know uh leading edge or bleeding edge on anything you know we want to just use very conventional and, and uh simple uh circuits so mm. and that's that's what our process right now as described is it's whole ore leaching. So it's crushing, grinding, agitated leach and dry stack tails. And the only little twist on it would be on the barren in that SAR plant, which we have a lot of experience in. And that's just to reduce process costs. Right. Oh, well, that's where you, you're coming from being sub $10, um, all in sustaining cost. Um, yeah. You say a little more recovery. Well, what will that mean specifically? How much, how, how little is little? Well, we don't have a number on it yet, but you know, if you can get uh, two or three more points on most of the silver, I mean, hey, it's eight million ounces a year. Three percent of eight million is not not that much. Uh, what would it be? Another oh, 140,000 ounces of silver doesn't sound like much, but it's it's kind of for free, right? Goes right to the bottom bottom line. So, okay. you know, we're we're looking at things like that. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to, but uh, certainly. In the definitive study, you know, we're, we're looking at every opportunity because one thing that um, occupies my thinking a little bit around metallurgy is, um, you know, when you're in the PEA, you're in the pre-feasibility, you do, you know, bigger composites of samples, and then you do your metallurgical testing. And, and now in this phase, more definitive, we're saying, okay, we know areas of the deposit have extremely high grade. And I, I recognize that, you know, that high grade may have been, you know, it's capped and it's, um, it just it diluted down quite a bit, but we do know there are going to be stopes with really, really high grade. So, you know, you don't want to lose any of that. You know, you don't, you don't want to, uh, rather it's having the process to, if you see, you know, high grade going out to the tailing pond to recycle right back through the mill again, uh, or if it's, um, you know, getting this really high grade that you say, Hey, maybe a, a gravity circuit 
for that portion of the deposit where you scalp out the real big chunks first and then the rest goes through your normal process. So we're looking at things like that in the metallurgy. And you know, before we release the definitive study, I'm sure we'll have some more press releases around that. Okay. You uh, right now you're running um nine, nine and a half million dollars of G and A a year. How do you see that evolving once you're into production or just between now and twenty twenty six? Yeah, yeah, I mean a G and A will go up. I mean, we're gonna be bringing on some more people and you know it's it'll be a bigger operation. But mm. um yeah, I, I would say not drastically. Um, I think we're in the study. We, you know, are all in sustaining costs. So I think we'll stay in line with our all in sustaining costs. Okay. The GNA. Well, could, okay. So if I if I say twelve, I mean, you you take it from nine and a half now to twelve. You produce eight million ounces. That'd be uh, about a buck fifty additional to your 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 total cost. Does that sound reasonable? Twelve million in GNA, or is that too much? Too little? I, I think, um, yeah, uh, I, 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 it's, it's, it's probably reasonable, but I would, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see as we get there. I mean, we're, we've never been, you know, of all the meetings I've done over the years, we've never been accused of being too high on the GNA. Hmm. No, no, I'm just trying to understand sort of like the overall cost per ounce of silver versus what you're going to be selling it for, also trying to apply a different silver price to it, given. Hmm where we all hope silver is going to be by 2026. Yep. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, let's maybe talk about growing the deposit here. Maybe let's let's call it growing the, the district, if you will, between those two things. I know there is somewhat of a, of a debate online whether what you have is tier one or tier two. Um, personally, I classify it as a very strong tier two with the potential to become tier one. But who cares about my opinion? Point is, or question is that I'm trying to ask here is, can you realistically make this into an undeniable tier one through the drill bit? And if you can, how do you do that? Mm. So we didn't stop drilling because we weren't hitting it. You know, we, we stopped because we had uh, uh, nine to 11 drill rigs running. And um, we were, every two weeks, we were putting out drill results with lots and lots of kilos of silver equivalent in the drill results. Um, and then... And we reached the amount of ounces, you know, we're up to about 280 million ounces in the district that, you know, we, we have enough to, to build and uh, good, good, good mine lives in both Las Ricos North and Las Ricos South. And let's face it, we were not getting the bang for the buck in drill results anymore. So it, it wasn't impacting the share price. Now, and we, we're heavily institutionally held, go, go gold. Um, and our institutional shareholders were saying to us, you know, we've seen uh, drill results now for almost five years. Tell us what it all means. Like, tell us what's the road to production, what's going to be the cash flow, what's, you know, all, what's it going to look like? So we turned our focus to there. And, um, but we will get back to exploration again um, as we get uh, Las Ricos in, South into production. And even before Las Ricos South is producing, like I was saying, we'll, we'll have some we hope to have a budget for Las Ricos North so we can keep on advancing that towards production. But where will the most impactful next ounces come from? Um, if you look at Las Ricos South and where we've drilled is the more shallower part of the deposit. Now that deposit was mined last from uh, 1908 to 1929 by uh, an American company. And they, they discovered that there was a Bonanza zone, um, at about 900, sorry, 1,060 meters above sea level, up to about all close to surface. And, um, and that was in the main zone where they were. Um, and that's where we started. Then we added on an additional claim to the northwest of that, which contiguous to the main zone. And there, that had not been mined before. And the amazing thing was that kind of elevation where you had the Bonanza grades carried right along strike into that new plane. And that's where we have our Eagle deposit. So the other thing that was really interesting was that um, we were able to get all the uh, data from that old mine. And it was in an archive up in Missoula, Montana, and in boxes, they'd probably been sitting in these boxes for 80 years, but everything, monthly reports, 7,000 underground samples from their mining. 
And in 1927, they found another boat, Bonanza Zone, from an elevation of about 600 meters above sea level to about uh, 900. And um, they were actually mining down there from 1927 till 19, uh, well, until they left in the first quarter of 1930. And it was political situation in Mexico, uh, revolution, and uh, I think one of the biggest issues, they couldn't get explosives. So they left, but they were in the heart of some of the highest grade ore that they mined out of the deposit. So to drill that from surface, the 750, 800 meter holes. Um, so we made the decision that when we get underground, we'll develop underground drill stations and we'll go after that next horizon. That's really, we know it's there. It's, we can't put in a resource or, you know, samples from a uh, hundred years ago, but we, we, we know it's there and we'll develop that horizon. So really that's going to push out, you know, a low grade halo open pit on the surface, even further and further into the future. Mm. And, and um, I had the map in front of me right now, you'd see, but there's, um, we had a, you know, we, we always kind of believe that we get all the data we can possibly get on a project before we drill and, you know, you know, no matter if the data is hundred years old and there's a map from 1916 and it just has cross hammers of all these mines and prospects. So in Las Ricos North, what we did was just started with that map in one area on the south side of the river. And, um, you know, we found those and a lot more. And uh, on the north side of the river, there's um, all kinds of small mines and prospects. We've never even been up there. Um, in Las Ricos South, there's um, uh, San Pedro and Alco, which is another um, small kind of, not, I wouldn't call it district, but a mining camp. Uh, within Los Ricos, that was a mine right up until 1980, and that's uh, we did some work over there. It's narrow vein, but very high grade, so that would be another target. So there's lots and lots of, of uh, exploration to do, but we didn't really want to drain the bank account down doing exploration, which wasn't giving us that much impact in the market, and then people start looking at the company and saying, "Well, you're going to have to do a financing." before you can get the debt portion to build. So, you know, we're cognitive of preserving our bank account mm. as well. Well, your, your responsibility here is, is creating shareholder value as, as, as companies always like seeing how do you do that is by making the stock price go up more or less. And the market right now is paying attention, like, do they get the permit or not? I think that's pretty much the first step. Then the second one is, do they get this thing built? So on and so far, I don't think anyone's really waiting for for drill results, as you mentioned. So I agree on that point. Is there a, an option, though, to, to connect the two land packages into one? They're 25 kilometers away from each other, so not a small feat, I don't imagine, but what do you think? Yeah, so I would say no. I, I would say because, in actually, again, if you the map here, see, it's it's actually a big fault that divides um, the, uh, the land packages. And that fault, um, if you put it back together, the displaced fault, they get closer together. So uh, really there's not as much distance between them as far as geologically, as far as deposit, as it appears. Um, and and then in Mexico right now, there, as there's noise around open pits, there's noise around staking new claims. In the last six years, there's really been no new claim staked. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another, uh, that's an issue. But we have a big land package. We have what we think is the, real mineralized land package and we have a lot more to explore so i i think with what we have and getting those two mines built yeah for me i i don't see a question that will be first tier hmm. you know asset and with exploration going again i mean uh with that kind of you know that kind of production those margins and uh we can turn on the exploration again once we achieve what we think you know, our shareholders want, which is that, you know, that roadmap and to get to production. Um, we can turn on the drills again and start showing that we'll be replacing reserves and more as we, uh, you know, do more exploration. Hearing you speak and specifically adding Peral to the mix as well, saying that it's going to get uh, now better over time. You've added that zinc circuit 
so on and so forth. It doesn't sound to me like you want to go to the public markets. Um, it doesn't sound like you're going to have to go to the public markets for financings. Um, but what do you think? I mean, is there, is, there an, is there a scenario where you see yourself ever going back to the public markets or is the idea to just um, uh, keep financing this with debt and cash flow? Yeah, we're we're not we don't have any plans to go into the public markets right now. Uh, you know for sure. And uh, you know if we're five dollars uh, in a short you know short amount of time, you know, I mean, come on, anybody would look at it and say, hey, if there's an appetite for four or five dollar stock, maybe. But uh, we can easily get very flexible uh, debt terms, and uh, and uh, certainly. Down here at a dollar fifty or two fifty, you know, or three, our, our shareholders aren't looking for us to go to the equity market again. Right, and I also don't assume you're thinking M and A in the meantime, uh, as as in you being the the perpetrator of M and A. But but I mean, worth the shot, I suppose. How do you envision M and A going forward? Well, I'd say as far as us buying anything, we we've got a lot on our plate right now. You know, we have, uh, um, you know, we have Las Ricos South and we have Las Ricos North. Right. And like I said, there's a tremendous amount of exploration there as well. Now, you know, that being said, I, you know, I am cognitive that there's some awfully cheap stuff out there, you know, some awfully cheap exploration projects where they have no capital. I mean, you know, I'm not blind, but I also think I don't want to send a, um, right now we're very, very focused on Las Rica South. We definitely don't want to send to the market the, impression there's anything wrong with what we have because there's not and uh you know we're going to get that uh that built and uh and look at it from from there forward you know and as far as m a in the other direction you know we've uh if you look at our kind of history we've done everything from building mines to you know uh defining deposits and uh, selling deposits to you know really whatever brings shareholder value and i'm you know, as far as reporting shareholders, I'm the second largest shareholder. So, um, you know, we're, I think I'm very well aligned with our shareholders. So I think right now, what's going to bring the most value is just get a permit, get in construction, get it built and start producing. That's well, where the value comes from. I tend to agree. And there's something I want to ask about that here in a second. But how do you you bring up a good point? You know, M&A in the under direction being taken over um, in a friendly or non-friendly manner. How do you guard this? I mean, you, you say you had, there's a Mexico discount to it right now, which I also tend to agree with. Mm -hmm. How do you guard it from someone stepping in and saying, you know, doing um, uh, trying to take you over when, you're, when, when your share price is as low as it is right now? Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, there's that Mexico discount and there's also the fact that I don't think anybody's going to take you over until you get a permit. Now, the day you get a permit, you might start getting a few knocks on the door, right? You know, and and I'm, I'm not putting that out there saying that that is in the works at all right now. Not, not at all. I, I've been in this business for over 30 years. I know you always, you always have CAs signed with people. You know, there's always somebody coming, discussing something, right? So... But um, really what we have to do is we need to, um, especially when we have that permit in hand, and now we have to be out there telling our story and we have to make sure that, you know, we're getting value in the market. And I think the day we get that permit, you know, the stock is really probably going to take off, you know, and that'll be some protection against uh, a non-wanted M and A, and I'm, I say no. You know, the one that we wouldn't want. I mean, we just want to, you know, value for the shareholder. Which again, I'm a large shareholder, and uh, been at this for a while. We don't want to be giving the company away for dollar fifty. That's for sure. Well, they, they, that's one way to create some FOMO out there. What is that? What's the royalty situation here on the Los Ricos projects? Uh, we we don't. Well, okay, to be a hundred percent to technically correct we would have on a couple claims in Los Ricos North that are not that significant there's a small royalty I think a percent and a half but we can buy that all out for like a million dollars so there's really no royalties in the uh, Los Ricos district right who owns that royalty that one and a half percent or that one percent of wages um, it, it, it's to um, uh, a uh, concession holder that we 
bought their concession and mm-hmm. uh, uh yeah it's it's just a private individual it's not uh it's not a streaming company or anything like that it's no one within the company absolutely no no okay fair no. point um yeah. how do you you mentioned something that I sort of want to ask more about that, but you're again, it's, it's, this whole conversation comes down to you're now, everything is about getting the permit then starting the build, then build it sort of in, in that order. How do you keep the market engaged in this uh, boring part of the Lausanne curve of you? How do you communicate to market? How do you market? Yeah, uh, you're right. In that Lausanne curve, you know, it's, it, it, it is true. You know, you go up and you're discovering and you're, you're drilling for five years and you're putting out smoke and grow results and, you know, things like 55 meters at 2.7 kilos and you get lots of value. And, uh, you know, we climbed the front end of that Lassonde curve at the same time we had a, a pandemic and, you know, people didn't know where the world was going and a lot more people wanted to jump into the precious, precious metals market. So fortunately what that did for us, we were able to, you know, build a very strong balance sheet. And um, now we're in the part of the Lausanne curve where, yeah, it's, it's a little more boring. I mean, it's more about engineering and it's more about, you know, doing good engineering and making sure this thing is constructed and delivered as expected. So we're, we're doing that. But um, I think we'll be through that sooner than you would think. I think that we go out there and we explain to people uh, that, here are other companies that we're going to look like when we're the producer. And I would say two of the great comparables are Silvercrest and Aya. So we'll look like that. And with Los Ricos North in production, eventually we'd be production like a Hecla. So you point out what their market caps are. And that's what the investor coming in here now is, is kind of betting on. So, um, you know, that we can deliver and uh, we can, we will. So and the other thing is it's a permit. I mean, let's just face it. Like a, the day I can hold up a permit and say, hey, we got a permit. We're ready to go. Boy, we got the balance sheet. We have the all kinds of people want to provide the debt. We have used the time, you know, to uh, get a definitive feasibility study done and a lot of extra engineering. I mean, it's just, it's a game changer. I don't think we've ever had a catalyst bigger than that permit. Mm. So... And uh, again, I feel very confident, very, very confident. We're going to get, it's not a doubt in my mind that we're going to get an underground permit. It's, it's um, you know, will we get it uh, midsummer? Or will we get it in September? Or will we get it in October? You know, so those would be more what I would um, say about the permit. Right now, I, I think we're going to get in the summer. Mm. 